Chapter 5 of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kirk Ziegler. Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2 by Havelock Ellis. Chapter 5. The Nature of Sexual Inversion, Part 1. Before stating briefly my own conclusions as to the nature of sexual inversion, I propose to analyze the facts brought out in the histories which I have been able to study. Race. All my cases, 80 in number, are British and American, 20 living in the United States and the rest being British. Ancestry, from the point of view of race, was not made a matter of special investigation. It appears, however, that at least forty-four are English, or mainly English. At least ten are Scotch, or of Scotch extraction. Two are Irish, and four others largely Irish. Four have German fathers or mothers. Another is of German descent on both sides, while two others are of remote German extraction. Two are partly, and one entirely French. Two have a Portuguese strain, and at least two are more or less Jewish. Except the apparently frequent presence of the German element, there is nothing remarkable in this ancestry. Heredity. It is always difficult to deal securely with the significance of heredity, or even to establish a definite basis of facts. I have by no means escaped this difficulty, for in some cases I have not even had an opportunity of cross-examining the subjects whose histories I have obtained. Still, the facts, so far as they emerge, have some interest. I possess some record of heredity in sixty-two of my cases. Of these, not less than twenty-four, or in the proportion of nearly thirty-nine per cent, assert that they have reason to believe that other cases of inversion have occurred in their families, and while in some it is only a strong suspicion. In others, there is no doubt whatever. In one case, there is reason to suspect inversion on both sides. Usually the inverted relatives have been brothers, sisters, cousins, or uncles. In one case, a bisexual son seems to have had a bisexual father. This heredity character of inversion, which was denied by Nicky, is a fact of great significance, and, as it occurs in cases which I am well acquainted, I can have no doubt concerning the existence of the tendency. The influence of suggestion may often be entirely excluded, especially when the persons are of different sex. Both Kraft Ebing and Moll noted a similar tendency. Von Rumer states that in one-third of his cases there was inversion in other members of the family. Hirschfeld also found that there is a relatively high proportion of cases of family inversion. Twenty-six, so far as can be ascertained, belong to reasonably healthy families. Minute investigation would probably reduce the number of these, and it is noteworthy that even in some of the healthy families there was only one child born of the parents' marriage. In twenty-eight cases there is more or less frequency of morbidity or abnormality, eccentricity, alcoholism, neurasthenia, insanity, or nervous disease, on one or both sides, in addition to inversion or apart from it. In some of these cases the inverted offspring is the outcome of the union of a very healthy with a thoroughly morbid stock. In some others there is a minor degree of abnormality on both sides. General Health It is possible to speak with more certainty of the health of the individual than that of his family. Of the eighty cases, fifty-three, or about two-thirds, may be said to enjoy good and sometimes even very good health though occasionally there is some slight qualification to be made. In twenty-two cases the health is delicate, or at best only fair. In these cases there is sometimes a tendency to consumption, and often marked neurasthenia, and a more or less unbalanced temperament. Four cases are morbid to a considerable degree. The remaining case had had insane delusions which required treatment in an asylum. A considerable proportion included among those as having either good or fair health may be described as of extremely nervous temperament, and in most cases they so describe themselves. 
a certain proportion of these combine great physical and especially mental energy with this nervousness. All these are doubtless of neurotic temperament. Very few can said to be conspicuously lacking in energy. On the whole, therefore, a large proportion of these inverted individuals are passing through life in an unimpaired state of health, which enables them to do at least their fair share of work in the world. In a considerable proportion of my cases that work is of highly intellectual value. Only in five cases, it will be seen, or at most six, can the general health be said to be distinctly bad. This result may, perhaps, seem surprising. It must, however, be remembered that my cases do not, on the whole, represent the class which alone the physician is usually able to bring forward. For example, the sexual inverts who are suffering from a more or less severe degree of complete nervous breakdown. There is no frequent relationship between homosexuality and insanity, and such homosexuality as is found in asylums is mostly of a spurious character. This point was especially emphasized by Nagy, Homosexualität und Psychose, Zeitschrift für Psychiatry, Volume 68, Number 3, 1911. He quoted the opinions of various distinguished alienists as to the rarity with which they had met genuine inverts and recorded his own experiences. He had never met a genuine invert in the asylum throughout his extensive experience although he was quite willing to admit that there may be unrecognized inverts in asylums, and one patient informed him after leaving that he was inverted and had attracted the attention of the police both before and afterward, though nothing happened in the asylum. Among 1,500 patients in the asylum during one year, active pedicatio occurred in about 1% of cases, these patients being frequently idiots or imbeciles, and at the same time, masturbators, solitary or mutual. Hirschfeld informed Nagy that among homosexual persons, hysterical conditions, not usually on hereditary basis, are fairly common, and neurasthenia of high degree decidedly frequent. But though stages of depression are common, he had never seen pure melancholia, and very seldom mania, but paranoic delusional ideas frequently and he agreed with Byron of Broadmoor that religious delusions are not uncommon. General paralysis occurs, but it is comparatively rare, and the same may be said of dementia praecox. On the whole, although Hirschfeld was unable to give precise figures, there was no reason whatever to suppose an abnormal prevalence of insanity. This was Nakey's own view. It is quite true, Nagy concluded, that homosexual actions occur in every form of psychosis, especially in congenital and secondary demence, and at periods of excitement. But we are here more concerned with pseudo-homosexuality than with true inversion. Hirschfeld finds that 75% inverts are of sound heredity. This seems too large a proportion. In any case, allowance must be made for differences in method and minuteness of investigation. I am fairly certain that thorough investigation would very considerably enlarge the proportion of cases with morbid heredity. At the same time, this enlargement would be chiefly obtained by bringing minor abnormalities to the front, and it would then have to be shown how far the families of average or normal persons are free from such abnormalities. The question is sometimes asked, what family tree is free from neuropathic taint? At present it is difficult to answer this question precisely. There is good ground to believe that a fairly large portion of families are free from such taint. In any case, it seems probable that the families to which the inverted belong do not usually present such profound signs of nervous degeneration as we were formerly led to suppose. What we vaguely call eccentricity is common among them. Insanity is much rarer. First Appearance of Homosexual Instinct Out of 72 cases, in 8, the instinct veered round to the same sex in adult age, or at all events after puberty. In three of these, there had been a love disappointment with a woman. No other cause than this can be assigned for the transition. But it is noteworthy that in at least two of these cases the sexual instinct is undeveloped or morbidly weak, 
while a third individual is of somewhat weak physique, and another has long been in delicate health. In a further case, also somewhat morbid, the development was rather more complicated. In 64 cases, or in a proportion of 88%, the abnormal instinct began early in life, without previous attraction to the opposite sex. In 27 of these, it dates from about puberty, usually beginning at school. In 39 cases, the tendency began before puberty, between the ages of 5 and 11, usually between 7 and 9, sometimes as early as the subject can remember. It must not be supposed that, in these numerous cases of the early appearance of homosexuality, the manifestations were of a specifically physical character, although erections were noted in a few cases. For the most part, sexual manifestation at this early age, whether homosexual or heterosexual, are purely psychic. Sexual Precocity and Hyperthesia it is a fact of considerable interest and significance that in so large a number of my cases there was distinct precocity of the sexual emotions, both on the physical and psychic sides. There can be little doubt that, as many previous observers have found, inversion tends strongly to be associated with sexual precocity. I think it may be further said that sexual precocity tends to encourage the inverted habit where it exists. Why this should be so is obvious. If we believe, as there is some reason for believing, that at an early age the sexual instinct is comparatively undifferentiated in its manifestations, the precocious accentuation of the sexual impulse leads to definite crystallization of the emotions at a premature stage. It must be added that precocious sexual energy is likely to remain feeble and that a feeble sexual energy adapts itself more easily to homosexual relationships, in which there is no definite act to be accomplished, than to normal relationships. It is difficult to say how many of my cases exhibit sexual weakness. In six or seven it is evident, and it may be suspected in many others, especially in those who are, and often describe themselves as, sensitive or nervous, as well as in those whose sexual development was very late. In many cases, there is marked hyperesthesia, or irritable weakness. Hyperesthesia simulates strength, and while there can be little doubt that some sexual inverts, and more especially bisexuals, do not possess unusual sexual energy, in others it is but apparent. The frequent repetition of seminal emissions, for example, may be the result of weakness as well as of strength. It must be added that this irritability of the sexual center is, in a considerable proportion of inverts, associated with marked emotional tendencies to affection and self-sacrifice. In the extravagance of his affection and devotion, it is frequently observed the male invert resembles any normal woman. Suggestion and Other Exciting Causes of Inversion in 18 of my cases, it is possible that some event or special environment in early life had more or less influence in turning the sexual instinct into homosexual channels or in calling out a latent inversion. In three cases, a disappointment in normal love seems to have produced a profound nervous and emotional shock, acting, as we seem bound to admit, on a predisposed organism and developing a fairly permanent tendency to inversion. In eight cases, there was seduction by an older person, but in at least four or five of these, there was already a well-marked predisposition. In at least eight other cases, example, usually at school, may probably be regarded as having exerted some influence. It is noteworthy that in very few of my cases can we trace the influence of any definite suggestion as asserted by Shrik Notzing, who believes that, in the causation of sexual inversion, as undoubtedly in the causation of erotic fetishism, we must give the first place to accidental factors of education and external influence. He records the case of a little boy who innocently gazed in curiosity at the penis of his father who was urinating, and had his ears boxed, whence arose a train of thought and feeling which resulted in complete sexual inversion. In two of the cases I have reported, we have parallel incidents. 
and here we see clearly that the homosexual tendency already existed. I do not question the occurrence of such incidents, but I refuse to accept them as supplying the causation of inversion, and in doing so I am supported by all the evidence I am able to obtain. I am in agreement with a correspondent who wrote, Considering that all the boys are exposed to the same order of suggestion, sight of a man's naked organs, sleeping with a man, being handled by a man, and that only a few of them become sexually perverted, I think it reasonable to conclude that those few were previously constituted to receive the suggestion. In fact, suggestion seems to play exactly the same part in the normal and abnormal awakening of sex. I would go so far as to assert that for normal boys and girls the developed sexual organs of the adult man or woman, from their size, hairiness, and the mystery which envelopes them, nearly always exert a certain fascination, whether of attraction or horror. But this has no connection with homosexuality, and scarcely with sexuality at all. Thus in one case known to me, a boy of six or seven took pleasure in caressing the organs of another boy, twice his own age, who remained passive and indifferent. Yet this child grew up without ever manifesting any homosexual instinct. The seed of suggestion can only develop when it falls on suitable soil. If it is to act on a fairly normal nature, the perverted suggestion must be very powerful or iterated, and even then its influence will probably only be temporary, disappearing in the presence of the normal stimulus. Not only is suggestion unnecessary to develop a sexual impulse already rooted in the organism, but when exerted in an opposite direction, it is powerless to divert that impulse. We see this illustrated in several of the cases whose history I have presented. Thus in one case a boy was seduced by the housemaid at the age of fourteen, and even derived pleasure from the girl. Yet none the less the native homosexual instinct asserted itself a year later. In another case heterosexual suggestions were offered and accepted in early life, yet notwithstanding the homosexual attraction was slowly evolved from within. I have therefore but little to say of the influence of suggestion, which was formally exalted to a position of the first importance in books on sexual inversion. This is not because I underestimate the great part played by suggestion in many fields of normal and abnormal life. It is because I have been able to find but few decided traces of it in sexual inversion. In many cases, doubtless there may be some slight elements of suggestion in developing the inversion, though they cannot be traced. Their importance seems usually questionable even when they are discovered. Take Shrek Notzing's case of the little boy whose ears were boxed for what his father considered improper curiosity. I find it difficult to realize that a mighty suggestion can thereby be generated unless a strong emotion exists for it to unite with. In that case, the seed falls on prepared soil. Is the wide prevalence of normal sexuality due to the fact that so many little boys have had their ears boxed for taking naughty liberties with women? If so, I am quite prepared to accept Schrenk Notzing's explanation as a complete account of the matter. I know of one case indeed in which an element of what may fairly be called suggestion can be detected. It is that of a physician who had always been on very friendly terms with men, but had sexual relations exclusively with women, finding fair satisfaction, until the confessions of an inverted patient one day came to him as a revelation. Thereafter he adopted inverted practices and ceased to find any attraction in women. But even in this case, as I understand the matter, suggestion merely served to reveal his own nature to the man. For a physician to adopt the perverted habits which the visit of a chance patient suggests to him can scarcely be a phenomenon of pure suggestion. We have no reason to suppose that this physician practiced every perversion he heard of from patients. He adopted that which fitted his own nature. In another case, homosexual advances were made to a youth and accepted, but he had already been attracted to men in childhood. Again, in another case... There were homosexual influences in the boyhood of a subject who became bisexual, but as the subject's father was of similar bisexual temperament, 
we can attach no potency to the mere suggestions. In another case, we find homosexual influence in childhood, but the child was already delicate, shy, nervous, and feminine, clearly possessing a temperament predestined to develop in a homosexual direction. The irresistible potency of the inner impulse is well illustrated in a case presented by Hirschfeld and Buchard. My daughter Emma, said the subject's mother, showed boys inclinations at the age of three, and they increased from year to year. She never played with dolls, only with tin soldiers and guns and castles. She would climb trees and jump ditches. She made friends with the drivers of all the carts that came to our house, and they would place her on the horse's back. The annual circus was a joy to her for all the year. Even as a child of four, she was so fearless on horseback that lookers-on shouted bravo, and all declared she was a born horsewoman. It was her greatest wish to be a boy. She would wear her elder brother's clothes all day, notwithstanding her grandmother's indignation. Cycling, gymnastics, boating, swimming were her passion, and she showed skill in them. As she grew older, she hated prettily adorned hats and clothes. I had much trouble with her, for she would not wear pretty things. The older she grew, the more her masculine and decided ways developed. This excited much outcry and offense. People found my daughter unfeminine and disagreeable, but all my trouble and exhortations availed nothing to change her. Now this young woman, whom all the influences of a normal feminine environment failed to render feminine, was not physiologically a woman at all. The case proved to be the unique instance of an individual possessing all the external characteristics of a woman, combined with the internal tescular tissue capable of emitting true masculine semen through the feminine urethra. No suggestions of the environment could suffice to overcome this fundamental fact of internal constitution. Hirschfeld and Buchard, Spermaskrischen, aus einer Wiblichen, Hanrohr, Deutsche Medizinische Wochenschrift, Number 52, 1911. I may here quote three American cases not previously published, for which I am debted to Professor Frank Lidston of Chicago. They seem to me to illustrate the only kind of suggestions which play much part in the evolution of inversion. I give them in Dr. Lidston's words. Case 1. A man, forty-five years of age, attracted by the allusion to my essay on social perversion, contained in the English translation of Kraft Ebing's Psychopathia Sexualis, consulted me regarding the possible cure of his condition. This individual was a finely educated, very intelligent man, who was an excellent linguist. He had considerable music ability, and was in the employ of a firm whose business was such as to demand on part of its employees considerable legal acumen, clerical ability, and knowledge of real estate transactions. This man stated that at the age of puberty, without any knowledge of perversity of sexual feeling, he was thrown intimately in contact with males of more advanced years, who took various means to excite his sexual passions, the result being that perverted sexual practices were developed, which were continued for a number of years. He thereafter noticed an aversion to women. At the solicitations of his family, he finally married, without any very intelligent idea as to what, if anything, might be expected of him in the marital relation. Absolute impotence, indeed repugnance for association with his wife, was the lamentable sequence. A divorce was in contemplation when, fortunately for all parties concerned, the wife suddenly died. Being a man of more than ordinary intelligence, this individual, prior to seeking my aid, had sought vainly for some remedy for his unfortunate condition. He stated that he believed there was an element of heredity in his case, his father having been a dipsomaniac, and one brother having died insane. He nevertheless stated it to be his opinion that notwithstanding the hereditary taint, he would have been perfectly normal from a sexual standpoint, had it not been for acquired impressions at or about the period of puberty. This man presented a typical neurotic type of physique, complained of being intensely nervous, was prematurely gray, of only fair stature, and had an uncontrollable nystagmus, which he said had existed for some fifteen years. 
As might be expected, treatment in this case was of no avail. I began the use of hypnotic suggestion at the hands of an expert professional hypnotist. The patient, being called out of the state, finally gave up treatment, and I have no means of knowing what his present condition is. Case 2. A lady patient of mine who happened to be an actress, and consequently a woman of the world, brought to me for an opinion some correspondence which had passed between her younger brother and a man living in another state, with whom he was on quite intimate terms. In one of these letters, various flying trips to Chicago for the purpose of meeting the lad, who, by the way, was only seventeen years of age, were alluded to. It transpired also, as evidenced by the letters, that on several occasions the young lad had been taken on trips in Pullman cars by his friend, who was a prominent railroad official. The character of the correspondence was such as the average healthy man would address to a woman with whom he was enamored. It seemed that the author of the correspondence had applied to this boy affinity the name Cinderella, and the protestations of passionate affection that were made towards Cinderella certainly would have satisfied the most exacting woman. The young lad subsequently made a confession to me, and I put myself in correspondence with his male friend, with the result that he called upon me and I obtained a full history of the case. The method of indulgence in this case was the usual one of oral masturbation, in which the lad was the passive party. I was unable to obtain any definite data regarding the family history of the elder individual in this case, but understand that there was a taint of insanity in his family. He himself was a robust, fine-looking man, above middle age, who was well-educated and very intelligent, as he necessarily must have been, because of the prominent position he held with an important railway company. I will state, as a matter of interest, that the lad in this case, who is now twenty-three years of age, has recently consulted me for impotentia coeundi, manifesting a frigidity for women, and from the young man's statements I am convinced that he is well on the road to confirm sexual perversion. An interesting point in this connection is that the young man's sister, the actress already alluded to, has recently had an attack of acute mania. I have other unpublished cases that might be of interest, but these two are somewhat classical, and typify to a greater or less degree the majority of other cases. I will, however, mention one other case occurring in a woman. Case 3. A married woman, forty years of age. She has been deserted by her husband because of her perverted sexuality. Neurotic history on both sides of the family, and several cases of insanity on the mother's side. In this case, affinity for the same sex and perverted desire for the opposite sex existed, a combination by no means infrequent. Hypnotic suggestion tried, but without success. Cause was evidently suggestion and example on the part of another female pervert with whom she associated before her marriage. Marriage was late at the age of thirty-five. In all these cases there was an element of what may be called suggestion, but it was really much more than this. It was probably in each case active seduction by an elder person of a predisposed younger person. It will be observed that in each case there was, at the least, an organic neurotic basis for suggestion and seduction to work on. I cannot regard these cases as entitled to modify our attitude towards suggestion. End of chapter 5, part 1 Chapter 5 of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. STUDIES IN THE PSYCHOLOGY OF SEX, VOLUME 2, BY HAVELOCK ELLIS CHAPTER V. THE NATURE OF SEXUAL INVERSION, PART 2 MASTURBATION Moreau believed that masturbation was a cause of sexual inversion, and Kraft Ebing looked upon it as leading to all sorts of sexual perversions. The same opinion was currently repeated by many writers. It is not now accepted. Moll emphatically rejected the idea that masturbation can be the cause of inversion. 
Nakey repeatedly denies that masturbation, any more than seduction, can ever produce true inversion. Hirschfeld attaches to it no etiological significance. Many years ago I gave special attention to this point and reached a similar conclusion, that masturbation, especially at an early age, may sometimes enfeeble the sexual activities and aid the manifestations of inversion, I certainly believe. Beyond this, there is little in the history of my male cases to indicate masturbation as a cause of inversion. It is true that 44 out of 51 admit that they have practiced masturbation, at all events, occasionally, or at some period in their lives, and it is possible that this proportion is larger than that found among normal people. Even if so, however, it is not difficult to account for, bearing in mind that the fact that the homosexual person has not the same opportunities as has the heterosexual person to gratify his instincts, and that masturbation may sometimes legitimately appear to him as the lesser of two evils. Not only has masturbation been practiced at no period in at least seven of the cases, for concerning several I have no information, but in several others it was never practiced until long after the homosexual instinct had appeared. In one case, not till the age of forty, and then only occasionally. In at least eight, it was only practiced at puberty. In at least eight, however, it began before the age of puberty. At least nine left off about the age of twenty. Unfortunately, as yet, we have little definite evidence as to the prevalence and extent of masturbation among normal individuals. Among the women, masturbation is found in at least five cases out of seven. In one case, there was no masturbation until comparatively late in life, and then only at rare intervals and under exceptional circumstances. In another case, some years after the homosexual attraction had been experienced, it was practiced, though not in excess, from the age of puberty for about four years, and then abandoned. During these years, the physical sexual feelings were more imperative than they were afterward felt to be. In two cases, masturbation was learned spontaneously soon after puberty, and in one of these, practiced in excess before the manifestations of inversion became definite. In all cases, the subjects are emphatic in asserting that this practice neither led to, nor was caused by, the homosexual attraction, which they regard as a much higher feeling, and it must be added that the occasional practice of masturbation is very far from rare among fairly normal women. While this is so, I am certainly inclined to believe that an early and excessive indulgence in masturbation, though not an adequate cause, is a favoring condition for the development of inversion, and that this is especially so in women. The sexual precocity indicated by early and excessive masturbation doubtless sometimes reveals an organism already predisposed to homosexuality. But, apart from this, when masturbation arises spontaneously at an early age on a purely physical basis, it seems to tend to produce a divorce between the physical and the psychic aspects of sexual love. The sexual manifestations are all diverted into this physical direction, and the child is ignorant that such phenomena are normally allied to love. Then, when a more spiritual attraction appears with adolescent development, this divorce is perpetuated. Instead of the physical and psychic feelings appearing together when the ego for sexual attraction comes, the physical feelings are prematurely twisted from their natural end, and it becomes abnormally easy for a person of the same sex to step in and take the place rightfully belonging to a person of the opposite sex. This has certainly seemed to me the course of events in some cases I have observed. Attitude Toward the Opposite Sex In seventeen cases, of whom five are married and others proposing to marry, there is a sexual attraction to both sexes, a conditionally formally called psychosexual hermaphroditism, but now more usually bisexuality. In such cases, although there is pleasure and satisfaction in relationship with both sexes, there is usually a greater degree of satisfaction in connection with one sex. Most of the bisexual prefer their own sex, it is curiously rare to find a person, whether man or woman, who by choice exercises relationships with both sexes and prefers the opposite sex. 
This would seem to indicate that the bisexual may really be inverts. In any case, bisexuality emerges imperceptibly into simple inversion. In at least 16 of 52 cases of simple inversion in men, there has been connection with women. In some instances, only once or twice, in others during several years, but it was always with an effort, or from a sense of duty and anxiety to be normal. They never experienced any real pleasure in the act, or sense of satisfaction after it. Four of these cases are married, but marital relationships usually cease after a few years. At least four others were attracted to women when younger, but are not now. Another once felt sexually attracted to a boyish woman, but never made any attempt to obtain any relationships with her. Three or four others, again, have tried to have connection with women, but failed. The largest portion of my cases have never had any sexual intimacy with the opposite sex, and some of these experience what, in the case of the male invert, is sometimes called or femina. But while woman as an object of sexual desire is in such cases disgusting to them, and it is usually difficult for a genuine invert to have connection with a woman except by setting up images of his own sex, for the most part inverts are capable of genuine friendships, irrespective of sex. It is perhaps not difficult to account for the horror, much stronger than normally felt toward a person of the same sex with which the invert often regards the sexual organs of persons of the opposite sex. It cannot be said that the sexual organs of either sex, under the influence of sexual excitement, are aesthetically pleasing. They only become emotionally desirable through the parallel excitement of the beholder. When the absence of parallel excitement is accompanied in the beholder by the sense of unfamiliarity, as in childhood, or by a neurotic hypersensitiveness, the conditions are present for the production of intense horror femina, or horror masculus, as the case may be. It is possible that, as Otto Rank argues in his interesting study, De Noctite im Saga und Dichtun, this horror of the sexual organs of the opposite sex, to some extent felt even by normal people, is embodied in the Melusine type of legend. Erotic Dreams Our dreams follow, as a general rule, the impulses that stir our waking psychic life. The normal man or woman in sexual vigor dreams of loving a person of the opposite sex. The inverted man dreams of loving a man, the inverted woman of loving a woman. Dreams thus have a certain value in diagnosis, more especially since there is less unwillingness to confess to a perverted dream than to a perverted action. Ulrichs first referred to the significance of the dreams of inverts. At a later period, Mull pointed out that they have some value in diagnosis when we are not sure how far the inverted tendency is radical. Then Nagy repeatedly emphasized the importance of dreams as constituting, he believed, the most delicate test we possess in the diagnosis of homosexuality. This was an exaggerated view which failed to take into account the various influences which may deflect dreams. Hirschfeld has made the most extensive investigation on this point and found that among 100 inverts, 87 had exclusively homosexual dreams, while most of the rest had no dreams at all. Among my cases, only four definitely state that there are no erotic dreams, while 31 acknowledge that the dreams are concerned more or less with persons of the same sex. Of these, at least 16 assert or imply that their dreams are exclusively of the same sex. Two, though apparently inverted congenitally, have had erotic dreams of women, in one case more frequently than of men. These two exceptions have no apparent explanation. Another appears to have sexual dreams of a nightmare character, in which women appear. In another case, there were always at first dreams of women, but this subject had sometimes had connection with prostitutes, and is not absolutely indifferent to women, while another, whose dreams remain heterosexual, had in early life some attraction to girls. In the cases of distinct bisexuality, there is no anonymity. Two dream of their own sex, two dream of both sexes, one usually dreams of the opposite sex, and one man, while dreaming of both, 
dislikes those dreams in which women figure. In at least three cases, dreams of sexual character begin at the age of eight or earlier. The phenomena presented by erotic dreams, alike in normal and abnormal persons, are somewhat complex. The dreams are by no means a sure guide to the dreamer's real sexual attitude. The fluctuation of dream imagery may be illustrated by the experiences of one of my subjects, who thus indirectly summarizes his own experiences. When he was quite a child, he used to be haunted by gross and grotesque dreams of naked adult men, which must have been erotic. At the age of puberty, he dreamed in two ways, but always about males. One species of vision was highly idealistic. A radiant and lovely young man's face with floating hair appeared to him on a background of dim shadows. The other was obscene, being generally the sight of a groomer's or carter's genitals in a state of violent erection. He never dreamed erotically or sentimentally about women, but when the dream was frightful, the terror-making personage was invariably female. In ordinary dreams, women of his family or acquaintance played a trivial part. At the age of twenty-four, having determined to conquer his homosexual passions, he married, found no difficulty in cohabitating with his wife, and begat several children, although he took little passionate delight in the sexual act. He still continued to dream exclusively of men for several years, and the obscene visions became more frequent than the idealistic. Gradually, coarse and uninteresting erotic dreams of women began to haunt his mind in sleep. A curious particular regarding the new type of vision was that he never dreamed of whole females, only of their sexual parts, seen in a blur, and the seminal emissions which attended the mental pictures left a feeling of fatigue and disgust. In course of time, his wife and he agreed to live separately so far as sexual relations are concerned. He then indulged his passion for males, and wholly lost those rudimentary female dreams which had been developed during the period of nuptial cohabitation. Not only is it possible for the genuine invert to be trained into heterosexual erotic dreams, but homosexual dreams may occasionally be experienced by persons who are, and always have been, exclusively heterosexual. I could bring forward much evidence on this point. Autoerotism in Volume 1 of These Studies Both men and women who have always been of pronounced heterosexual tendency without a trace of inversion are liable to rare homosexual dreams, not necessarily involving orgasm or even definite sexual excitement, and sometimes accompanied by a feeling of repugnance. As an example, I may present a dream, which had no known origin, of an exclusively heterosexual lady aged forty-two. She dreamed she was in bed with another woman, unknown to her, and lying on her own stomach, while with her right hand stretched out she was feeling the other's sexual parts. She could distinctly perceive the clitoris, vagina, etc. She felt a sort of disgust with herself for what she was doing, but continued until she awoke. She then found herself lying on her stomach as in the dream, and at first thought she must have been touching herself, but realized that this could not have been the case. Nisforo, who believes that inversion may develop out of masturbation, considers that the dreams of masturbation by association of ideas may take on an inverted character. Lipsicopesi Swala, 1897, page 3569. This, however, must be rare and will not account for most of the dreams in question. Nakey and Colin Scott, some years ago, independently referred to cases in which normal persons were liable to homosexual dreams, and Ferrer, Revue de Médecine, December 1898, referred to a man who had a horror of women, but appeared only to manifest homosexuality in his dreams. Archi for Criminal Anthropologie, 1907, Haft 1 and 2 calls dreams which represent a reaction of opposition to the dreamer's ordinary life contrast dreams. Hirschfeld, who accepts Nakey's contrast dreams in relation to homosexuality, considers that they indicate a latent bisexuality. We may admit this is so, in the same sense in which a complementary color image called up by another color 
indicates the possibility of perceiving that color. In most cases, however, it seems to me that homosexual dreams in normal persons may be simply explained as due to the ordinary confusion and transition of dream imagery. See Ellis, The World of Dreams, especially Chapter 2. Methods of Sexual Relationship The exact mode in which an inverted instinct finds satisfaction is frequently of importance from the medical-legal standpoint. From a psychological standpoint, it is of minor significance, being chiefly of interest as showing the degree to which the individual has departed from the instinctive feelings of his normal fellow beings. Taking fifty-seven inverted men, of whom I have definite knowledge, I find that twelve, restrained by moral or other considerations, have never had any physical relationship with their own sex. In some twenty-two cases, the sexual relationship rarely goes beyond close physical contact and fondling, or at most, mutual masturbation and intercrural intercourse. In ten or eleven cases of fellatio, oral excitation, frequently in addition to some form of mutual masturbation, and usually, though not always, as the active agency, is the form preferred. In fourteen cases, actual pedicchio, usually active, not passive, has been exercised. In these cases, however, pedicatio is by no means always the habitual or even the preferred method of gratification. It seems to be the preferred method in about seven cases. Several who have never experienced it, including some who have never practiced any form of physical relationship, state that they feel no objection to pedicatio. Some have this feeling in regard to active, others in regard to passive pedicatio. The proportion of inverts who practice or have at some time experienced pedicatio, thus revealed nearly 25%, is large. In Germany, Hirschfeld finds it to be only 8%, and Mertzbach only 6 I believe, however, that a wider induction from a larger number of English or American cases would yield a proportion much nearer to that found in Germany. Pseudosexual Attraction It is sometimes supposed that in homosexual relationships one person is always active, physically and emotionally, the other passive. Between men, at all events, this is very frequently not the case, and the invert cannot tell if he feels like a man or like a woman. Thus one writes, In bed with my friend I feel as if he feels, and he feels as I feel. The result is masturbation, and nothing more or desire for more on my part. I get it over to as soon as possible, in order to come to the best, sleeping arms around each other, or talking so. It remains true, however, that there may usually be traced what it is possible to call pseudosexual attraction, by which I mean a tendency for the invert to be attracted toward persons unlike himself, so that in his sexual relationships there is a certain semblance of sexual opposition. Numa Praetorius considers that in homosexuality the attraction of opposites, the attraction for soldiers and other primitive vigorous types, plays a greater part than among normal lovers. This pseudo-sexual attraction is, however, as Hirschfeld points out, and as we see by the histories here presented, by no means invariable. M. N. writes, To me it appears that the female element must, of necessity, exist in the body that desires the male, and that nature keeps her law in the spirit, though she breaks it in the form. The rest is all a matter of individual temperament and environment. The female nature of the invert, hampered though it is by its disguise of flesh, is still able to exert an extraordinary influence, and calls incessantly upon the male. This influence seems called into action most violently in the presence of males possessed of strong sexual magnetism of their own. Such men are generally more or less conscious of the influence and the result is either a vague appreciation which will make the male wonder why he gets on so well with the invert, or else the influence will be realized to be something incongruous and unnatural, and will be resented accordingly. Sometimes, indeed, the reciprocated feeling, circumstance and opportunity permitting, will prove strong enough to induce sexual relations. 
Reason will then generally overpower instinct, and the feeling, aroused unaware, will probably be changed into repulsion. Further, the influence reacts in the same way on women, who particularly, if they are strongly sexual, experience involuntary sensations of dislike or antagonism on association with inverts. There is, however, one terrible reality for the invert to face, no matter how much he may wish to avoid it and seek to deceive himself. There exists for him an almost absolute lack of any genuine satisfaction either in the way of affections or desires. His whole life is passed in vainly seeking and desiring the male, the antithesis of his nature, and in consorting with inverts he must perforce be content with the male in form only, the shadow without the substance. Indeed, one invert necessarily regards another as being of the same undesired female sex as himself, and for this reason it will be found that while friendships between inverts frequently exist, and these are characteristically feminine, unstable, and liable to betrayal, love attachments are less common, and when they occur must naturally be based upon considerable self-deception. Venal gratifications are always, of course, as possible as they are unsatisfactory, and here perhaps some of the peculiarities of taste accompanying inversion may admit of elucidation. In considering the peculiar predilection shown by inverts for youths of inferior social position, for the wearers of uniforms, and for extreme physical development and virility not necessarily accompanied by intellectuality, Regard must be had to the probable conduct of women, placed in a position of complete irresponsibility, combined with absolute freedom of action, and every opportunity for promiscuity. It seems to me that the importance of recognizing the underlying female element in inversion cannot be too strongly insisted upon. The majority of inverts, writes Z, differ in no detail of their outward appearance, their physique, or their dress from normal men. They are athletic, masculine in habit, frank in manner, passing through society year after year without arising a suspicion of their inner temperament. Were it not so, society would long ago have had its eyes open to the amount of perverted sexuality it harbors. These lines were written not in opposition to the more subtle distinctions pointed out above, but in refutation of the vulgar error which confuses the typical invert with the painted and petticoated features who appear in police courts from time to time, and whose portraits are presented by Lombroso, Legludic, etc. On another occasion, the same writer remarked, while expressing general agreement with the idea of a pseudo-sexual attraction, the liaison is by no means always sought and begun by the person who is abnormally constituted. I mean that I can cite cases of decided males who have made up to inverts, and have found their happiness in the reciprocated passion. One pronounced male of this sort again once said to me, Men are so much more affectionate than women. Precisely the same words were used by one of my subjects. Also, the liaison springs up now and then quite accidentally through juxtaposition, when it is difficult to say whether either at the outset had an inverted tendency of any marked quality. In these cases the sexual relation seems to come on as a heightening of comradely affection, and is found to be pleasurable, sometimes, I think, discovered to be safe as well as satisfying. On the other hand, so far as I know, it is extremely rare to observe a permanent liaison between two pronounced inverts. The tendency to pseudo-sexual attraction in the homosexual would thus seem to involve a preference for normal persons. How far this is the case, it seems difficult to state positively. Usually, one may say, an invert falls in love, exactly as in the case of a normal person, without any intellectual calculation as to the temperamental ability to return the affection which the object of his love may possess. Naturally, however, there cannot be any adequate return of the affection in the absence of an actual or latent homosexual disposition. On this point, an American correspondent, H.C., with a wide knowledge of inversion in many lands, writes, 
one of your correspondents declares that inverts long for sexual relations with normal men rather than with one another if this be true i have never once found it exemplified in all my wide experience of inverts and i have submitted his assertion to more than fifty these have been replied invariably that unless a man is himself homosexual nearly all the pleasure of fellatio is absent the fact is the majority of inverts flock together not from exigency but from choice the mere sexual act is if anything far less the sole object between inverts than it is between normal men and women why should the inverts sigh for intercourse with normal men where mutual confidences and sympathies and love would be out of the question personally i decline to commit fellatio with a man who is given to women the thought of it is repugnant to me and this is the attitude with every invert i have questioned the nearest approach to confirmation of your correspondence theory has been when an extremely feminine invert here and there has admitted the wish that a certain normal man were inverted indeed the temperamental gamut of inversion is itself broad enough to embrace the most widely divergent ideals as my furthest reaching demands attain fruition in the gentle and pretty boy so his own robuster affinity resides in me if inverts were actually women then indeed the normal male would be their ideal but inverts are not women inverts are males capable of passionate friendship and their ideal is the male who will give them passionate friendship in return in at least twenty-four probably many more of my male cases there is a marked contrast and in still a larger number a less marked contrast between the subject and the individuals he is attracted to either he is of somewhat feminine and sensitive nature and admires more simple and virile natures or he is fairly vigorous and admires boys who are often of a lower social class inverted women are also attracted to more clinging feminine persons a sexual attraction for boys is no doubt as mall points out that form of inversion which comes nearest to normal sexuality for the subject of it usually approaches nearer to the average man in physical and mental disposition the reason of this is obvious boys resemble women and therefore it requires a less profound organic twist to become sexually attracted to them anyone who has watched private theatricals in boys schools will have observed how easy it is for boys to personate women successfully and it is well known that until the middle of the seventeenth century women's parts on stage were always taken by boys whether or not with injury to their own or other people's morals it is also worthy of note that in greece where homosexuality flourished so extensively and apparently with so little accompaniment of neurotic degeneration it was often held that only boys under eighteen should be loved so that the love of boys emerged into love of women about eighteen of my cases are most strongly attracted to youths preferably about the age of eighteen to twenty and they are for the most part among the more normal and healthy of the cases a preference for older men or else a considerable degree of indifference to age alone is more common and perhaps indicates a deeper degree of perversion putting aside the age of the object desired it must be said that there is a distinctly general though not universal tendency for sexual inverts to approach the feminine type either in psychic disposition or physical constitution or both i cannot say how far this is explained by the irritable nervous system and delicate health which are so often associated with inversion though this is certainly an important factor although the invert himself may stoutly affirm his masculinity and although this femininity may not be very obvious its wide prevalence may be asserted with considerable assurance and by no means only among the small minority of inverts who take an exclusive passive role though in these it is usually most marked in this i am confirmed by q who writes in all or certainly most cases the cases of congenital male inverts excluding psychosexual hermaphrodites that i know there has been a remarkable sensitiveness and delicate sentiment sympathy and an intuitive habit of mind such as we generally associate with the feminine sex even though the body might be quite masculine in its form and habit 
when however a distinguished invert said to mo we are all women that we do not deny he put the matter into extreme form the feminine traits of the homosexual are not usually of a capricious nature i believe that inverts of plainly feminine nature are rare exceptions wrote nakey and that statement may be accepted even by those who emphasize the prevalence of feminine traits among inverts in inverted women some degree of masculinity or boyishness is equally prevalent and it is not usually found in the women to whom they are attracted even in inversion the need for a certain sexual opposition the longing for something which the lover himself does not possess still prevails it expresses itself sometimes in an attraction between persons of different race and color i am told that in american prisons for women lesbian relationships are especially frequent between white and black women a similar affinity is found among the arabs says coker and if an arab woman has a lesbian friend the latter is usually european in cochin china too according to lorion while the chinese are chiefly pederasts the anamites are chiefly passive it must however be remembered that in normal love homogamy the attraction of the like prevails over heterogamy and the attraction of the unlike which is chiefly confined to those features which belong to the sphere of the secondary sexual characters the same appears to be true in inversion and the homosexual are probably on the whole more attracted by the traits which they seem to themselves to possess than by those which are foreign to themselves End of chapter 5, part 2。Chapter 5 of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2, by Havelock Ellis. Chapter 5. The Nature of Sexual Inversion, Part 3. Physical Abnormalities. The circumstances under which many of my cases were investigated often made information under this head difficult to obtain or to verify. In at least four cases the penis is very large, while in at least three it is small and undeveloped with small and flabby testes. It seems probable that variations in these two directions are both common, but it is doubtful whether they possess as much significance as the tendency to infantilism or the sexual organs in inverted women seems to possess. Hirschfeld considers that the genital organs of inverts resemble those of normal people. He finds, however, that phimosis is rather common. More significant, perhaps, than specifically genital peculiarities are the deviations found in the general conformation of the body. In at least two cases there are well-developed breasts, in one of the breasts swelling and becoming red. In one case there are menstrual phenomena, physical and psychic, recurring every four weeks. In several cases the hips are broad and the arms rounded, while some are skillful in throwing a ball. One was born with a double squint. At least two were seven months' children. In the previous chapter I have referred to the tendency to hypertrichnosis, and occasionally oligotrichnosis among inverted women. Among the men it is the latter condition which seems more common, and in several cases the bodies are hairless, or with but scanty hair. A few are left-handed, though not perhaps an abnormal proportion. The sexual characters of the handwriting are in some cases clearly inverted, the men writing a feminine hand and the women a masculine hand. A high feminine voice is sometimes found. A marked characteristic of many inverts, though one is not easy of precise definition, is their youthful appearance and frequently childlike faces, equally in both sexes. This has often been remarked and is pronounced among many of my subjects. The frequent inability of male inverts to whistle was first pointed out by Ulrich, and Hirschfeld has found it in 23%. Many of my cases confess to this inability, while some of the women inverts can whistle admirably. 
Although this inability of male inverts is only found among a minority, I am quite satisfied that it is well marked among a considerable minority. One of my correspondents, M. N., writes to me, With regard to the general inability of inverts to whistle, I am not able to do so myself. Their fondness for green, my favorite color, their feminine calligraphy, skill at female occupations, etc., these all seem to me but indication of the one principle. To go still farther and include trivial things, few inverts even smoke in the same manner and with the same enjoyment as a man. They have seldom the male facility at games, cannot throw at a mark with precision, or even spit. Nearly all these peculiarities indicate a minor degree of nervous disturbance and lead to modification, as my correspondent points out, in a feminine direction. It is scarcely necessary to add that they by no means necessarily imply inversion. Shelley, for instance, was unable to whistle, though he never gave an indication of inversion, but he was a person of somewhat abnormal and feminine organization, and he illustrates the tendency of these apparently very insignificant functional anomalies to be correlated with other and more important psychic anomalies. The greater part of these various anatomical peculiarities and functional anomalies point, more or less clearly, to the prevalence among inverts of a tendency to infantilism, combined with feminism in men and masculinism in women. This tendency is denied by Hirschfeld, but it is often well indicated among the subjects whose history I have been able to present, and is indeed suggested by Hirschfeld's own elaborate results so that it can scarcely be passed over. I regard it as highly significant, and it is in harmony with all that we are learning to know regarding the important part played by the internal secretions, alike in inversion and the general bodily modifications in an infantile, feminine, and masculine direction. If we are justified in believing that there is a tendency for inverted persons to be somewhat arrested in development, approaching the child type, we may connect this fact with the sexual precocity sometimes marked in inverts, for precocity is commonly accompanied by rapid arrest of development. A correspondent who is himself inverted furnishes the following notes of cases he is well acquainted with. I quote them here as they illustrate the anomalies commonly found. 1. A male, eldest child of a typically neurotic family. Three children in all, two male and one female. The other two are somewhat eccentric, unsocial, and sexually frigid, one in a marked degree. The curious point about this case is that A, the only one of the family possessed of mental ability and social qualifications, should be inverted. Parents' marriage was very ill-assorted and inharmonious, the father being of great stature and the mother abnormally small and of highly nervous temperament, both of feeble health. Ancestry unfortunate, especially on the mother's side. 2. B. Male, invert. Younger of two sons, no other children. Has extremely feminine disposition and appearance, of considerable personal attraction, and has great musical talent. Penis is very small and marked breast development. 3. C. Male, invert. Younger of two sons, no other children. Interval of six years between first and second son. Parents' marriage, one of great affection, but degenerate ancestry on mother's side, cancer, and scrofula in family. 4. D. Male. Invert, second child of six. Remainder girls. Of humble social position. Considerable depravity evinced by all the members of this family, with the exception of D., who alone proved steady, honest, and industrious. 5. E. Male. Invert. Second son of family of three, the youngest child being a girl, stillborn, of extreme neurotic temperament, fostered by upbringing, effeminate in build and disposition, musically gifted. 6. F. Male, invert, second child of family of five, eldest child, a girl, died in youth. After F., a boy G., a girl age, and another girl stillborn, parents badly matched. Mother of considerable mental and physical strength. Father last representative of moribund stock. The result of intermarriage. Children all resembling father in appearance and mother in disposition. 
drink tendency in both boys, to which F.'s death at the age of 30 was mainly due. G. committed suicide some years later. The girl H., married into a family with worse ancestry than her own, has two children. 7. I. and J., boy and girl, both inverted as far as I am able to judge. The boy was born with some deformity of the feet and ankles, is of effeminate taste and appearance. Boy resembles mother, and girl, who is of great physical development, resembles father. The same correspondent adds, I have noticed little abnormal with regard to the genital formation of inverts. These are, however, frequent abnormalities of proportion in their figures, the hands and feet being noticeably smaller and more shapely, the waist more marked, the body softer and less muscular. Almost invariably there is either cranial malformation or the head approaches the feminine in type and shape. Artistic and other aptitudes. All avocations are represented among inverts. Among the subjects here dealt with are found, at one end of the scale, numerous manual workers, and at the other end an equal number, sometimes of aristocratic family, who exercise no profession at all. There are twelve physicians, nine men of letters, at least seven are engaged in commercial life, six are artists, architects, or composers, four are or have been actors. These figures cannot give any clue to the relative extent of inversion in various occupations, but they indicate that no class of occupation furnishes a safeguard against inversion. There are, however, certain avocations which inverts seem especially called. One of the chief of these is literature. The apparent predominance of physicians is easily explicable. The frequency with which literature is represented is probably more genuine. Here, indeed, inverts seem to find the highest degree of success and reputation. At least half a dozen of my subjects are successful men of letters, and I could easily add others by going outside the group of histories included in this study. They especially cultivate those regions of bellus literis, which lie on the borderland between prose and verse. Though they do not usually attain much eminence in poetry, they are often very accomplished writers of verse. They may be attracted to history, but rarely attempt tasks of great magnitude, involving much patient labor, though to this rule there are exceptions. Pure science seems to have relatively little attraction for the homosexual. An examination of my histories reveals the interesting fact that 45 of the subjects, or in proportion of 56%, possess artistic aptitudes of varying degree. Galton found, from the investigation of nearly 1,000 persons, that the average showing artistic tastes in England was only about 30%. It must also be said that my figures are probably below the truth, as no special point was made of investigating the matter, and also that in some cases the artistic ability is of high order. It is suggested that Alder's theory of Mender Verticite according to which we react strenuously against our congenital organic defects and fortify them into virtues, may be applied to the invert's requirement of artistic abilities. G. Rosenstein, Die Torin der Organmeinder Verticite und die Bisexualität Jahrbuch für Psychoanalytische Forschungen, Volume 2, 1910, page 398. This theory is in some cases of valuable application, but it seems doubtful to me whether it is very profitable in the present connection. The artistic aptitudes of inverts may be better regarded as part of their organic tendencies than as a reaction against those tendencies. In this connection, I may quote the remarks of an American correspondent, himself a homosexual. Regarding the connection between inversion and artistic capacity, so far as I can see, the temperament of every invert seems to strive to find artistic expression, crudely or otherwise. Inverts, as a rule, seek the paths of life that lie in pleasant places. Their resistance to opposing obstacles is elastic. Their work is never strenuous, if they can help it, and their accomplishments hardly ever of practical use. This is all true of the born artist, as well. Both inverts and artists are inordinately fond of praise, both yearn for a life where admiration is the reward for little energy. In a word, they seem to be born tired, 
begotten by parents who were tired too. Hirschfeld, De Homosexualität, page 66, gives a list of pictures and sculptures which especially appeal to the homosexual. Prominent among them are representations of St. Sebastian, Gainsborough's Blue Boy, Van Dyck's Youthful Men, the Hermes of Praxiteles, Michelangelo's Slave, Rodin's and Meunier's Working Men Types. As regards music, my cases reveal the aptitude which has been marked by others as peculiarly common among inverts. It has been extravagantly said that all musicians are inverts. It is certain that various famous musicians, among the dead and the living, have been homosexual. Ingignero speaks of a genito musical synesthesia, analogous to color hearing in this connection. Felicia states, Archivo di Psychiatria, 1900, page 209, that 60% inverts are musicians. Hirschfeld, De Homosexualität, page 500, regards this estimate as excessive, but he himself elsewhere states, page 175, that 98% of male inverts are greatly attracted to music, the women being decidedly less attracted. Oppenheim, in a paper summarized in the Neurologische Zentralblatt for June 1, 1910, and the Alienist and Neurologist for November 1910, well remarks that the musical disposition is marked by a great emotional instability, and this instability is a disposition to nervousness. It is thus that neurasthenia is so common among musicians. The musician has not been rendered nervous by the music, but he owes his nervousness, as also it may be added his disposition to homosexuality, to the same disposition to which he owes his musical aptitude. Moreover, the musician is frequently one-sided in his gifts, and the possession of a single hypertrophied aptitude is itself closely related to the neurophatic and psychophatic diathesis. The tendency to dramatic aptitude, found among a large portion of my subjects who have never been professional actors, has attracted the attention of previous investigators in this field. Thus Mall refers to the frequency of artistic, and especially dramatic, talent among inverts, and remarks that the case is doubtful. After pointing out that the lie which they have to be perpetually living renders inverts always actors, he goes on to say, Apart from this, it seems to me that the capacity and the inclination to conceive situations and to represent them in a masterly manner corresponds to an abnormal predisposition of the nervous system, just as does sexual inversion, so that both phenomena are due to the same source. I am in agreement with this statement. The congenitally inverted may, I believe, be looked upon as a class of individuals exhibiting nervous characters which, to some extent, approximate them to persons of artistic genius. The dramatic and artistic aptitudes of inverts are therefore partly due to the circumstances of the invert's life, which render him necessarily an actor, and in some few cases lead him into a love of deception comparable with that of a hysterical woman, and partly, it is probable, to a congenital nervous predisposition allied to the predisposition to dramatic aptitude. One of my correspondents has long been interested in the frequency of inversion among actors and actresses. He knew an inverted actor who told him he adopted the profession because it would enable him to indulge his proclivity. But on the whole, he regards this tendency as due to hitherto unconsidered imaginative flexibilities and curiosities in the individual. The actor, ex hypothesis is one who works himself by sympathy, intellectual and emotional, into states of psychological being that are not his own. He learns to comprehend, nay, to live himself into, relations which were originally alien to his nature. The capacity for doing this, what makes a born actor, implies a faculty for extending his artistically acquired experience into life. In the process of his trade, therefore, he becomes at all points sensitive to human emotions, and sexuality being the most intellectual undetermined of the appetites after hunger, the actor might discover himself in a sort of sexual indifference, out of which a sexual aberration could easily arise. A man devoid of this imaginative flexibility could not be a successful actor. 
the man who possesses it would be exposed to divagations of the sexual instinct under aesthetical or merely wanton influences. Something of the same kind is applicable to musicians and artists, in whom sexual inversion prevails beyond the average. They are conditioned by their aesthetical faculty and encouraged by the circumstances of their life to feel and express the whole gamut of emotional experience. Thus they get an environment which, unless they are sharply otherwise differentiated, leads easily to experiments in passion. All this joins on to what you call the variational diathesis of men of genius. But I should seek the explanation of the phenomena less in the original sexual constitution than in the exercise of sympathetic, assimilative emotional qualities, powerfully stimulated and acted on by the conditions of the individual's life. The artist, the singer, the actor, the painter, are more exposed to the influences out of which sexual differentiation in an abnormal direction may arise. Some persons are certainly made abnormal by nature. Others, of this sympathetic artistic temperament, may become so through their sympathies plus their conditions of life. It is possible there may be some element of truth in this view, which my correspondent regarded as purely hypothetical. In this connection I may, perhaps, mention a moral quality, which is very often associated with dramatic aptitude, and also with minor degrees of nervous degeneration and that is vanity and the love of applause. While among a considerable section of inverts, it is not more marked than among the non-inverted, if not indeed less marked. Among another section it is found in an exaggerated degree. In at least one of my cases, vanity and delight in admiration, both as regards personal qualities and artistic productions, reach an almost morbid extent and the quotations from letters written by various others of my subjects show a curious complacency in the description of their personal physical characters, markedly absent in other cases. It is suggested by Alexander Schmid, on the basis of Alder's views, that this vanity, which sometimes in the inverted artist becomes an exalted pride, as of a guardian of sacred mysteries, may be regarded as an effort to secure a compensation for the consciousness of feminine defect. The extreme type of this preoccupation with personal beauty is represented by the history of himself, sent by a young Italian of good family to Zola, in the hope, itself a sign of vanity, that the distinguished novelist would make it the subject of one of his works. The history is reproduced in the Archives de Anthropologie Criminella, 1894, and in La Homosexualité et les Types Homosexuels, 1910, by Dr. Laups, G. St. Paul. I quote the following passage. At the age of eighteen I was, with few differences, what I am now at twenty-three. I am rather below the medium height, 1.65 meters, well-proportioned, slender, but not lean. My torso is superb. A sculptor would find nothing against it, and would not find it very different from that of Antonitis. My back is very arched, perhaps too much so, and my hips are very developed. My pelvis is broad, like a woman's. My knees slightly approximate. My feet are small. My hands superb. The fingers curve back with glistening nails, rosy and polished, cut squarely like those of ancient statues. My neck is long and round, the nap charmingly adorned with downy hairs. My head is charming, and at eighteen was more so. The oval of it is perfect and strikes all by its infantine form. At twenty-three I am to be taken for seventeen at most. My complexion is white and rosy, deepening at the faintest emotion. The forehead is not beautiful. It recedes slightly and is hollow at the temples, but fortunately it is half covered by long hair, of a dark blonde which curls naturally. The head is a perfect form because of the curly hair, but on examination there is an enormous protuberance at the occiput. My eyes are oval, of a gray-blue, with dark chestnut eyelashes and thick arched eyebrows. My eyes are very liquid, but with dark circles and blistered, and they are subject to slight temporary inflammation. My mouth is fairly large, with thick red lips, the lower pendant. They tell me I have the Austrian mouth. My teeth are dazzling, though three are decayed and stopped. Fortunately, they cannot be seen. My ears are small and with very colored lobes. 
My chin is very fat, and at eighteen it was smooth and velvety as a woman's. At present there is a slight beard, always shaved. Two beauty spots, black and velvety, on my left cheek contrast with my blue eyes. My nose is thin and straight, with delicate nostrils and a slight, almost insensible curve. My voice is gentle, and people always regret that I have not learned to sing. This description is noteworthy as a detailed portrait of a sexual invert of a certain type. The whole history is interesting and instructive. Certain peculiarities in taste as regards costume have rightly or wrongly been attributed to inverts. Apart from the tendency of a certain group to adopt feminine habits, and may here be mentioned, Tardieu, many years ago, referred to the taste for keeping the neck uncovered. This peculiarity may occasionally be observed among inverts, especially the more artistic among them. The cause does not appear to be precisely vanity so much as that physical consciousness which is so curiously marked with inverts and induces the more feminine among them to cultivate feminine grace of form and the more masculine to emphasize the masculine athletic habit. It has also been remarked that inverts exhibit a preference for green garments. In Rome, Cinetti were for this reason called Galbanati. Chevalier remarks that some years ago a band of pederasts at Paris wore green cravats as a badge. This decided preference for green is well marked in several of my cases of both sexes, and in some at least the preference certainly arose spontaneously. Green, as Yastro and others have shown, is very rarely the favorite color of adults of the Anglo-Saxon race, though some inquirers have found it to be more commonly a preferred color among children, especially girls, and it is more often preferred by women than by men. The favorite color among normal women, and indeed very often among normal men, though here not so often as blue, is red, and it is notable that of recent years there has been a fashion for a red tie to be adopted by inverts as their badge. This is especially marked among the fairies, as a fellerator is there termed, in New York. It is red, writes an American correspondent, himself inverted. That has become almost a synonym for sexual inversion, not only in the minds of inverts themselves, but in the popular mind. To wear a red necktie on the street is to invite remarks from newsboys and others, remarks that have the practices of inverts for their theme. A friend told me once that when a group of street boys caught sight of the red necktie he was wearing, they sucked their fingers in imitation of fellatio. Male prostitutes who walk the streets of Philadelphia and New York almost invariably wear red neckties. It is the badge of all their tribe. The rooms of many of my inverted friends have red as the prevailing color in decorations. Among my classmates at the medical school, few ever had the courage to wear a red tie. Those who did never repeated the experiment. Moral Attitude of the Invert There is some interest in tracing the invert's own attitude toward his anomaly and his estimate of its morality. As my cases are not patients seeking to be cured of their perversion, this attitude cannot be taken for granted. I have noted the moral attitude in fifty-seven cases. In eight, the subjects loathe themselves and have fought in vain against their perversion, which they often regard as a sin. Nine or ten are doubtful and have little to say in justification of their condition, which they regard as perhaps morbid, a moral disease. One, while thinking it right to gratify his natural instincts, admits that they may be vices. The remainder, a large majority including all the women, are, on the other hand, emphatic in their assertion that their moral position is precisely the same as that of the normally constituted individual, on the lowest ground a matter of taste, and at least two state that homosexual relationship should be regarded as sacramental, a holy matrimony. Two or three even regard inverted love as nobler than ordinary sexual love. Several add the proviso that there should be consent and understanding on both sides, and no attempt at seduction. The chief regret of two or three is the double life they are obliged to lead. When inverts have clearly faced and realized their own natures, it is not so much, it seems, their conscience that worries them, or even the fear of the police, as the attitude of the world. An American correspondent writes, 
It is the fear of public opinion that hangs above them like the sword of Damocles. This fear is the heritage of all of us. It is not the fear of conscience, and it is not engendered by a feeling of wrongdoing. Rather, it is a silent submission to prejudices that meet us on every side. The normal attitude of the sexual invert, and I have known hundreds, with regards to his particular passion, is not essentially different from that of the normal man with regard to his. It is noteworthy that even when the condition is regarded as morbid, and even when a life of chastity has, on this account, been deliberately chosen, it is very rare to find an invert expressing any wish to change his sexual ideals. The male invert cannot find, and has no desire to find, any sexual charm in a woman, for he finds all possible charms united in a man. And a woman invert writes, I cannot conceive a sadder fate than to be a woman, an average woman reduced to the necessity of loving a man. It will be seen that my conclusions under this head are in striking contrast to those of Westfall, who believe that every invert regarded himself as morbid, and probably show a much higher proportion of self-approving inverts than any previous series. This is largely due to the fact that the cases were not obtained from the consulting room, and that they represent in some degree the intellectual aristocracy of inversion, including individuals who, often not without severe struggles, have found consolation in the example of the Greeks or elsewhere, and have succeeded in attaining a modus vivendi with the moral world, as they have come to conceive it. End of chapter 5 Recording by Kirk Ziegler, Ogden, Utah Voiceovers by Kirk.com Chapter 6 of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2, by Havelock Ellis. Chapter 6. The Theory of Sexual Inversion, Part 1. The analysis of these cases leads directly up to a question of the first importance. What is sexual inversion? Is it, as many would have us believe, an abominably acquired vice to be stamped out by the prison? Or is it, as a few assert, a beneficial variety of human emotion which should be tolerated or even fostered? Is it a diseased condition which qualifies its subject for the lunatic asylum? Or is it a natural monstrosity, a human sport, the manifestations of which must be regulated when they become antisocial? There is probably an element of truth in more than one of these views. Very widely divergent views of sexual inversion are largely justified by the position and attitude of the investigator. It is natural that the police official should find that his cases are largely mere examples of disgusting vice and crime. It is natural that the asylum superintendent should find that we are chiefly dealing with a form of insanity. It is equally natural that the sexual invert himself should find that he and his inverted friends are not so very unlike ordinary persons. We have to recognize the influence of professional and personal bias and the influence of environment. There have been two main streams of tendency in the views regarding sexual inversion, one seeking to enlarge the sphere of the acquired, represented by Binet, who, however, recognized predisposition, schrank notzing and recently the Freudians, the other seeking to enlarge the sphere of the congenital, represented by Kraft Ebing, Moll, Ferré, and today by the majority of authorities. There is, as usually happens, truth in both these views. But, inasmuch as those who represent the acquired view often deny any congenital element, we are called upon to discuss the question. The view that sexual inversion is entirely explained by the influence of early association or of suggestion is an attractive one and at first sight it seems to be supported by what we know of erotic fetishism by which a woman's hair or foot or even clothing becomes the focus of a man's sexual aspirations. But it must be remembered that what we see in erotic fetishism is merely the exaggeration of a normal impulse. Every lover is to some extent excited by his mistress' hair or foot or clothing. Even here, therefore, there is really what may fairly be regarded as a congenital element, and, moreover, there is reason to believe that the erotic fetishist usually displays the further congenital element of hereditary neurosis. Therefore, the analogy with erotic fetishism does not bring much help to those who argue that inversion is purely acquired. 
it must also be pointed out that the argument for acquired or suggested inversion logically involves the assertion that normal sexuality is also acquired or suggested if a man becomes attracted to his own sex simply because the fact of the image of such attraction is brought before him then we are bound to believe that a man becomes attracted to the opposite sex only because the fact or the image of such attraction is brought before him such a theory is unworkable in nearly every country of the world men associate with men and women with women if association and suggestion were the only influential causes then inversion instead of being the exception ought to be the rule throughout the human species if not indeed throughout the whole zoological series we should moreover have to admit that the most fundamental human instinct is so constituted as to be equally well adapted for sterility as for that propagation of the race which as a matter of fact we find dominant throughout the whole of life we must therefore put aside entirely the notion that the direction of the sexual impulse is merely a suggested phenomenon such a notion is entirely opposed to observation and experience and will with difficulty fit into a rational biological scheme the freudians alike of the orthodox and the heterodox schools have sometimes contributed unintentionally or not to revive the now antiquated conception of homosexuality as an acquired phenomenon and that by insisting that its mechanism is a purely psychic though unconscious process which may be readjusted to the normal order by psychoanalytic methods freud first put forth a comprehensive statement of his view of homosexuality in the original and pregnant little book drei abhandlungen zu sexualtheorie in 1905 and has elsewhere frequently touched on the subject as have many other psychoanalysts including alfred adler and steckel who no longer belong to the orthodox freudian school when inverts are psychoanalytically studied freud believes it is found that in early childhood they go through a phase of intense but brief fixation on a woman usually the mother or perhaps sister then an internal censure inhibiting this incestuous impulse they overcome it by identifying themselves with women and take refuge in narcissism the self becoming the sexual object finally they look for youthful males resembling themselves whom they love as their mothers love them the pursuit of man is thus determined by their flight from women this view has been set forth not only by freud but by sedger steckel and many others freud himself however is careful to state that this process only represents one type of standard sexual activity and that the problem of inversion is complex and diversified this view may be said to assume a bisexual constitution as normal and homosexuality arises by the suppression owing to some accident of the heterosexual component and the path through an autoerotic process of narcissism to homosexuality on this general freudian conception of homosexuality numerous variations have been based and separate features specially emphasized by individual psychoanalysts thus Satcher considers that beneath the male individual love by the invert a female is concealed and that this fact may be revealed by psychoanalysis which removes the upper layer of the psychic palimpsest he believes that this disposition of the invert is favored by the frequent mixture of male and female traits in his near relatives it is not man whom the homosexual man loves and desires but man and woman together in one form the heterosexual element is later suppressed and then pure inversion is left further developing freud's view of the importance of anal eroticism freud Sammlung kleiner Schriften zur Neurosenlehre, Volume 2. Satcher thinks that it is even the rule for a passive invert to have experienced anal eroticism in childhood and been frequently subjected to animals which have led to the desire for the anal intromission of the penis. Medizinische Klinik, 1909, number 2. Jekylls pushes this doctrine further and declares that all inverts are really passive. The invert is, in his love, he states, both subject and object, he identifies himself with his mother and sees in the object of his love his own youthful person and what jekylls asks is the aim of this mental arrangement it can scarcely be other he replies than in the part of the mother to stimulate the anal region of the object which has now become himself and to procure the same pleasure which in childhood he experienced when his mother satisfied his anal eroticism jekylls regards this view as the continuation and concretization of freud's interpretation and the main point in homosexuality even when apparently passive becomes the craving for anal erotic satisfaction l jekylls einige bemerkungen zur trieblehre internationale zeitschrift für ärztliche psychoanalyse september 1913
most psychoanalysts are cautious in denying a constitutional or continental basis to inversion, though they leave it in the background. Ferenczi, in an interesting attempt to classify the homosexual, Internationale Zeitschrift für Ärztliche Psychoanalyse, March 1914, remarks, psychoanalytic investigation shows that under the name of homosexuality the most various psychic states are thrown together, on the one hand true constitutional anomalies, inversion or subject homoeroticism, on the other hand psychoneurotic obsessional conditions, object homoeroticism or obsessional homoeroticism. The individual of the first kind essentially feels himself a woman who wishes to be loved by a man, while the other represents a neurotic flight from women rather than sympathy to men. The constitutional basis is very definitely accepted by Rudolf Ortwey, who points out, Internationale Zeitschrift für Ärztliche Psychoanalyse, January 1914, that the biological doctrine of recessives and dominance in heredity helps to make clear the emergence or suppression of homosexuality on a bisexual disposition. Infantile events, he adds, which, according to Freud, decide the sexual relations of adults, can only exert their operation on the foundation of an organic predisposition, infantile impressions being determined by hereditary predispositions. Isidore Coriat, on the other hand, while recognizing two forms of inversion, incomplete and complete, boldly asserts that it is never congenital and never transmitted through heredity. It is always originated through a defined unconscious mechanism. Coriat, Homosexuality, New York Medical Journal, March 22, 1913. Ada's view of homosexuality, as of other elite conditions, differs from that of most psychoanalysts by insisting on the presence of an original organic defect which the subject seeks to fortify into a point of strength. He accepts two chief components of inversion, a vagueness as to sexual differences and a process of self-assurance in the form of rebellion and defiance, and even the feminism of the invert may become a method of gaining power. A. Adler, Über die Neurosen Charakter, 1912, page 21. The mechanism of the genesis of homosexuality put forward by Freud need not be dismissed offhand. Freud has often manifested the insight of genius, and he refrains from molding his conceptions in those inflexible shapes which have sometimes been adopted by the more dogmatic psychoanalysts who have followed him. Nor need we be unduly shocked by the incestuous air of the Oedipus complex, as it is commonly called, which figures as a component of the process. The word incest, though it has been used by Freud himself, seems scarcely a proper word to apply to the vague and elementary feelings of children, especially when those feelings scarcely pass beyond the stage of non-localized and therefore really pre-sexual feelings, in the ordinary use of the term sexual, which may be regarded as natural and normal. The Freudian conception is misrepresented and prejudiced by the statement that it involves incest. When a child loves its mother with an entire love, the love necessarily involves the germs which in later life become separated and developed into sexual love, but it is inaccurate to term this love of the child incestuous. It is quite easily conceivable that the psychic mechanism of the establishment of homosexuality has in some cases corresponded to the cause described by Freud. It may also be admitted that, as psychoanalysts claim, the pronounced horror feminine occasionally found in male inverts may plausibly be regarded as the reversal of an early and disappointed feminine attraction. But it is impossible to regard this mechanism as invariable or even frequent. It is quite true, and I have found ample evidence of the fact that inverts are often very closely attached to their mothers, even to a greater degree, indeed, than is the rule among normal children and often like to be in constant association with their mothers. But this attraction is quite misunderstood if it is regarded as a peculiarly sexual attraction. Indeed, the whole point of the attraction is that the inverted boy vaguely feels his own feminine disposition and so shuns the uncongenial amusements and society of his own sex for the sympathy and community of tastes which he finds concentrated in his mother. So far from such association being evidence of sexual attraction, it might more reasonably be regarded as evidence of its absence. Just as the association of boys among themselves and of girls among themselves, even co-educational schools, is proof of the prevalence of heterosexual rather than homosexual feeling. Confirmation of this point of view may be found in the fact, overlooked and sometimes even denied by psychoanalysts, that frequently, even early childhood and simultaneously with this community of feeling, 
of his mother, the homosexual boy is already experiencing the predominant fascination of the male. He feels it long before the age at which narcissism is apt to occur, or at which self-consciousness has become sufficiently developed to allow the internal censure on unpermitted emotions to operate, or any flight from them to take place. Moreover, while most authorities have rarely been able to find any clear evidence of the sexual attraction of male inverts in childhood to mother or sister, an attraction of this kind to father or brother seems less difficult to find, and if found, it is incompatible with the typical Freudian process. In my own observation, among the histories here recorded, there are at least two clear examples of such an attraction in childhood. It must further be said that any theory of the etiology of homosexuality which leaves out of account the hereditary factor in aversion cannot be admitted. The evidence for the frequency of homosexuality among the near relatives of the inverted is now indisputable. I have traced it in a considerable proportion of cases, and in many of these the evidence is unquestionable and altogether independent of the statement of the subject himself, whose opinion may be held to be possibly biased or unreliable. This hereditary factor seems indeed to be called for by the Freudian theory itself. On that theory we need to know how it is that the subject passes through the psychic phases and reaches an emotional disposition so unlike that of normal persona. The existence of a definite hereditary tendency in a homosexual direction removes that difficulty. Freud himself recognizes this and clearly asserts congenital psychosexual constitution which must involve predisposition. On a general survey, therefore, it would appear that, on a psychic side, we may accept the reality of unconscious dynamic processes, which in particular cases may be of the Freudian or similar type. But while the study of such mechanisms may illuminate the psychology of homosexuality, they leave untouched the fundamental organic factors now accepted by most authorities. The rational way of regarding the normal sexual instinct is as an inborn organic impulse, reaching full development about the time of puberty. During the period of development, suggestions and associations may come in to play a part in defining the object of the emotion. The soil is now ready, but the variety of seeds likely to thrive in it is limited. That there is a greater indefiniteness in the aim of sexual impulse at this period we may believe. This is shown not only by occasional tentative signs of sexual emotion directed toward the same sex in childhood, but by the frequently ideal and unlocalized character of the normal passion even at puberty. But the channel of sexual emotion is not thereby turned into an abnormal path. Whenever this happens, we are bound to believe, and we have many grounds for believing, that we are dealing with an organism which from the beginning is abnormal. The same seed of suggestion is sown in various soils. In the many it dies out, in the few it flourishes. The cause can only be difference in the soil. If we must postulate a congenital abnormality in order to account satisfactorily for at least a large proportion of sexual inverts, wherein does that abnormality consist? Ulrichs explained the matter by saying that in sexual inverts a male body coexists with a female soul. Anima mulebris in corpore virile inclusa. Even writers of scientific eminence like Magnan and Clay have adopted this phrase in a modified form considering that in version, a female brain is combined with a male body or male glands. This is, however, not an explanation. It merely crystallizes into an epigram the superficial impression of the matter. We can probably grasp the nature of the abnormality better if we reflect on the development of the sexes and on the latent organic bisexuality in each sex. At an early stage of development, the sexes are indistinguishable, and throughout life the traces of this early community of sex remain. The hen fowl retains in a rudimentary form the spurs which are so large and formidable in her lord, and sometimes she develops a capacity to crow or puts on male plumage. Among mammals, the male possesses useless nipples, which occasionally even develop into breasts, and the female possesses a clitoris, which is merely a rudimentary penis and may also develop. The sexually inverted person does not usually possess any gross exaggeration of these signs of community with the opposite sex. But, as we have seen, there are a considerable number of more subtle approximations in the opposite sex in inverted persons, both on the physical and the psychic side. Putting the matter in a purely speculative shape, it may be said that at conception the organism is provided with about 50% of male germs and about 50% of female germs, and that, as development proceeds, either the male or the female germs assume the upper hand, 
until in a maturely developed individual only a few aborted germs of the opposite sex are left in the homosexual however and in the bisexual we may imagine that the process has not proceeded normally on account of some peculiarity in the number or character of either the original male germs or female germs or both the result being that we have a person who is organically twisted into a shape that is more fitted for the exercise of the inverted than of the normal sexual impulse or else equally fitted for both end of chapter six part one recording by Jule niedermeyer chapter six of studies in the psychology of sex volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. studies in the psychology of sex volume two by havelock ellis chapter six the theory of sexual inversion part two the conception of the latent bisexuality of all males and females cannot fail to be fairly obvious to intelligent observers of the human body it emerges at an early period in the history of philosophic thought and from the first was occasionally used for the explanation of homosexuality plato smith in the banquet and the hermaphroditic statues of antiquity show how acute minds working ahead of science exercise themselves with these problems for a fully illustrated study of the ancient conception of hermaphroditism in sculpture see l s a m von römer über die androgynische idee des lebens jahrbuch für sexuelle zwischenstufen volume five nineteen o three pages seven hundred eleven to nine hundred thirty nine parmenides following alcmeon the philosophic physician who discovered that the brain is the central organ of intellect remarks gompertz greek thinkers english translation volume one page one hundred eighty three used the idea of variation in the proportion of male and female generative elements to account for idiosyncrasies of sexual character after an immense interval hersley the inverted swiss man milliner in his eros eighteen thirty eight put forth the greek view anew schopenhauer again from the philosophical side recognized the bisexuality of the human individual see julius burger allgemeine zeitschrift für psychiatrie nineteen twelve page six hundred and thirty and ulrichs from eighteen sixty two onward adopted a similar doctrine on a platonic basis to explain the uranian constitution after this the idea began to be more precisely developed from the scientific side though not at first with reference to homosexuality and more especially by the great pioneers of the doctrine of evolution darwin emphasized the significance of the facts on this point as later weismann while heckel who was one of the earliest darwinians has in recent years clearly recognized the bearing on the interpretation of homosexuality of the fact that the ancestors of the vertebrates were hermaphrodites as vertebrates themselves still are in the embryonic disposition heckel in jahrbuch für sexuelle zwischenstufen april nineteen thirteen pages two hundred sixty two three and two hundred eighty seven this view had however been set forth at an earlier date by individual physicians notably in america by kiernan american lancet eighteen eighty four and medical standard november and december eighteen eighty eight and Lidston, Philadelphia Medical and Surgical Reporter, September 1889, and Addresses and Essays, 1892. In 1893, in his La Version Sexuelle, Chevalier, a pupil of La Cassagne, who had already applied the term hermaphrodism moral to this anomaly, explained congenital homosexuality by the idea of latent bisexuality. Dr. G. de Letamendi, Dean of the Faculty of Medicine of Madrid, in a paper read before the international medical congress at rome in eighteen ninety four set forth a principle of pan hermaphroditism a hermaphroditic bipolarity which involved the existence of latent female germs in the male latent male germs in the female which latent germs may strive for and sometimes obtain the mastery in february eighteen ninety six the first version of the present chapter setting forth the conception of inversion as a psychic and somatic development on the basis of a latent bisexuality was published in the zentralblatt für nervenheilkunde und psychiatrie corella i b i d may eighteen ninety adopted a somewhat similar view even arguing that the invert is a transitional form between the complete man or woman and the hermaphrodite in germany a patient of kraft ebbing had worked out the same idea connecting inversion with fetal bisexuality eighth edition psychopathia sexualis page two hundred twenty seven 
Krafft Ebing himself at first simply asserted that, whether congenital or acquired, there must be belastung. Inversion is a degenerate phenomenon, a functional sign of degeneration. Kraft Ebing, zur Erklärung der konträren Sexualempfindung, Jahrbuch für Psychiatrie, 1894. In the later editions of Psychopathia Sexualis, however, 1896 and onward, and notably in Jahrbuch für sexuelle Zwischenstufen, Volume 3, 1901, he went farther, adopting the explanation on the lines of original bisexuality. English translation of 10th edition, pages 336 and 7. In much the same language as I have used, he argued that there has been a struggle in the centers, homosexuality resulting when the center antagonistic to that represented by the sexual gland conquers, and psychosexual hermaphroditism resulting when both centers are too weak to obtain victory. In either case, such disturbance not being a psychic degeneration or disease, but simply an anomaly comparable to a malformation and quite consonant with psychic health. This is the view now widely accepted by investigators of sexual inversion. Much material bearing on the history of this conception has been brought together by Hirschfeld in Die Homosexualität, Chapter 19 and previously in Vom Wesen der Liebe, Jahrbuch für sexuelle Zwischenstufen, Volume 8, 1906, pages 111 to 133. A similar allied view is now constantly met within writers of scientific authority who are only incidentally concerned with the study of sexual inversion. Thus, Halban, Die Entstehung des Geschlechtscharaktere, Archiv für Gynäkologie, 1903, regards hermaphroditism, which he would extend to the psychic sphere, as a state in which a double sexual impulse determines the cause of fetal and later development. Shattock and Seligman, True Hermaphroditism in the Domestic Fowl, Remarks on Allopterotism, Transactions of Pathological Society of London, Volume 7, Part 1, 1906, pointing out that mere atrophy of the ovary cannot account for the appearance in the handbird of male characters which are not retrogressive but progressive, argues that such birds are really bisexual or hermaphrodite, either by the single ovary being really bisexual, as was the case with a fowl they examined, or that the sexual glands are paired, one being male and the other female, or else that there is misplaced male tissue in a neighboring viscous, like the adrenal or kidney, the male elements asserting themselves when the female elements degenerate. Hermaphroditism, they conclude, far from being a phenomenon altogether abnormal amongst the higher vertebrates, should be viewed rather as a reversion to the primitive ancestral phase in which bisexualism was the normal disposition. True hermaphroditism in man being established, the question arises whether lesser grades do not occur. Remote evidence of bisexuality in the human subject may, perhaps, be afforded by the psychical phenomenon of sexual perversion and inversion. Similarly, in a case of unilateral secondary male character in an otherwise female pheasant, C.J. Bond, has more recently shown, Section of Zoology, Birmingham, Meeting of British Medical Association, British Medical Journal, September 20, 1913, that an obitestis was present with degenerating ovarian tissue and developing testicular tissue, and such islands of actively growing male tissue can frequently be found, he states, in the degenerating ovaries of female birds which have put forth male plumage. Sir John Bland Sutton, referring to the fact that the external conformation of the body affords no positive certainty as to the nature of the internal sexual glands, adds British Medical Journal, October 30, 1909. It is a fair presumption that some examples of sexual frigidity and sex perversion may be explained by the possibility that the individuals concerned may possess sexual glands opposite in character to those indicated by the external configuration of their bodies. Looking at the matter more broadly and fundamentally in its normal aspects, Heap declares, Proceedings of the Cambridge Philosophical Society, Volume 14, Part 2, 1907, that there is no such thing as a pure male or female animal, but that all contain a dominant and recessive sex, except those hermaphrodites in which both sexes are equally represented. There seems to me ample evidence for the conclusion that there is no such thing as a pure male or female. F. H. A. Marshall, again, in the Standard Manual, The Physiology of Reproduction, 1910, page 655, at sequence, is inclined to accept the same view. If it be true, he remarks, 
that all individuals are potentially bisexual and that changed circumstances leading to a changed metabolism may in exceptional circumstances even adult life cause the development of the recessive characters it would seem extremely probable that the dominance of one set of sexual characters over the other may be determined in some cases at an early stage of development in response to stimulus which may be either internal or external so also very hard a typical male and female sex ensembles a paper read before Edinburgh Obstetrical Society, British Medical Journal, June 20, 1914, page 1355, regards the normal male or female as embodying a maximum of the potent organs of his or her own sex with a minimum of non-potent organs of the other sex, with secondary sex traits congruent. Any increase in the minimum gives a diminished maximum and non-congruence of the secondary characters. We thus see that the ancient medico-philosophic conception of organic bisexuality put forth by the Greeks as the key to the explanation of sexual inversion after sinking out of sight for two thousand years was arrived early in the nineteenth century by two amateur philosophers who were themselves inverted, Hösli Ulrichs, as well as by a genuine philosopher who was not inverted, Schopenhauer. Then the conception of latent bisexuality, independently of homosexuality, was developed from the purely scientific side by darwin and evolutionists generally in the next stage this conception was adopted by the psychiatric and other scientific authorities on homosexuality kraft ebbing and the majority of other students finally embryologists physiologists of sex and biologists generally not only accept the conception of bisexuality but admit that it probably helps to account for homosexuality in this way the idea may be said to have passed into current thought we cannot assert that it constitutes an adequate explanation of homosexuality but it enables us in some degree to understand what for many is a mysterious riddle and it furnishes a useful basis for the classification not only of homosexuality but of the other mixed or intermediate sexual anomalies in the same group the chief of these intermediate sexual anomalies are first physical hermaphroditism in its various stages second Genandromorphism or unicoidism, in which men possess characters resembling those of males who have been early castrated and women possess similarly masculine characters. Third, sexo-aesthetic inversion or ionism, Hirschfeld's transvestism or cross-dressing, in which, outside the specifically sexual emotions, men possess the tastes of women and women those of men. Hirschfeld has discussed these intermediate sexual stages in various works, especially in Geschlechtsübergänge, 1905, Die Transvestiten, 1910, and Chapter 11 of Die Homosexualität. Hermaphroditism, the reality of which has only of late been recognized and is still disputed, and pseudo-hermaphroditism in the physical variations are fully dealt with in a great work richly illustrated, Hermaphroditismus bei Menschen, by F. L. von Neugebauer of Warschau. Neugebauer published an earlier and briefer study of the subject in the Jahrbuch für sexuelle Zwischenstufen, Volume 4, 1902, pages 1 to 176, with a bibliography in Volume 8, 1906, of the same Jahrbuch, pages 685 to 700. Hirschfeld emphasizes the fact that neither hermaphroditism nor unicoidism is commonly associated with homosexuality, and that a large portion of the cases of transvestism, as defined by him, are heterosexual. True inversion seems, however, to be not infrequently found among pseudohermaphrodites. Neugebauer records numerous cases. Magnan has published a case in a girl brought up as a youth, Gazette Medicale de Paris, March 31, 1911, and La Pointe, a case in a man brought up as a girl. Revue de Psychiatrie, 1911, page 219. Such cases may be accounted for by the training and association involved by the early era in recognition of sex, and perhaps still more by a really organic predisposition of homosexuality. Although the sexual psychic characters are not necessarily bound up with the coexistence of corresponding sexual clans. Halban, Archiv für Gynäkologie, 1903, goes so far as to class the homosexual as real pseudo-hermaphrodites, exactly comparable to a man with a female breast or a woman with a beard, and proposes to term homosexuality pseudohermaphroditus masculinus psychicus. This, however, is an unnecessary and scarcely satisfactory confusion. 
to place the group of homosexual phenomena among other intermediate groups on the organic bisexual basis is a convenient classification it can scarcely be regarded as a complete explanation it is probable that we may ultimately find a more fundamental source of these various phenomena in the stimulating and inhibiting play of the internal secretions our knowledge of the intimate association between the hormones and sexual phenomena is already sufficient to make such an explanation intelligible the complex interaction of the glandular internal secretions and the liability to varying disturbance in balance may well suffice to account for the complexity of the phenomena it would harmonize with what we know of the occasional delayed manifestations of homosexuality and would not clash with the congenital nature for we know that the disordered state of thymus for instance may be hereditary and it is held that status lymphaticus may be either inborn or acquired normal sexual characters seem to depend largely upon the due coordination of the internal secretions and it is reasonable to suppose that sexual deviations depend upon their incoordination if a man is a man and a woman a woman because in Bleabel's phrase of the totally of the internal secretions the intermediate stages between the man and the woman must be due to redistribution of these internal secretions we know that various internal secretions possess an influential sexual effect thus the atrophy of the thymus seems to be connected with sexual development at puberty the thyroid reinforces the genital glands adrenal overdevelopment can produce in a female the secondary characteristics of the male as well as cause precocious development of maleness etc an alteration in the metabolism as f h a marshall suggests even in comparatively late life may initiate changes in the direction of the opposite sex metabolic chemical processes may thus be found to furnish a key to complex and subtle sexual variations alike somatic and psychic although we must still regard such processes as arising on an inborn predisposition whatever its ultimate explanation sexual inversion may thus fairly be considered a sport or variation one of those organic aberrations which we see throughout living nature in plants and in animals it is not here asserted as i would carefully point out that an inverted sexual instinct or organ for such instinct is developed in early embryonic life such a notion is rightly rejected as absurd what we may reasonably regard as formed at an early stage of development is strictly a predisposition that is to say such a modification of the organism that it becomes more adapted than the normal or average organism to experience sexual attraction to the same sex the sexual invert may thus be roughly compared to the congenital idiot to the instinctive criminal to the man of genius who are all not strictly concordant with the usual biological variation because this is of a less subtle character but who becomes somewhat more intelligible to us if we bear in mind the affinity to variations simmons compared inversion to the color blindness and such a comparison is reasonable just as the ordinary color blind person is congenitally insensitive to those red green rays which are precisely the most impressive to the normal eye and gives an extended value to the other colors finding that blood is the same color as grass and the florid complexion blue as the sky so the invert fails to see emotional values patent to normal persons transferring those values to emotional associations which for the rest of the world are utterly distinct or we may compare inversion to such a phenomenon as color hearing in which there is not so much defect as an abnormality of nervous tracts producing new and involuntary combinations just as the color hearer instinctively associates colors with sounds like the young japanese lady who remarked when listening to singing boy's voice is red so the invert has his sexual sensations brought into relationship with objects that are normally without sexual appeal and inversion like color hearing is found more commonly in young subjects tending to become less marked or to die out after puberty color hearing while an abnormal phenomenon it must be added cannot be called a diseased condition and it is probably much less frequently associated with other abnormal or degenerative stigmata than is inversion there is often a congenital element shown by the tendency to hereditary transmission while the associations are developed in very early life and are too regular to be the simple result of suggestion 
all such organic variations are abnormalities. It is important that we should have a clear idea as to what an abnormality is. Many people imagine that what is abnormal is necessarily diseased. That is not the case, unless we give the word disease an inconveniently and illegitimately wide extension. It is both inconvenient and inexact to speak of color blindness, criminality, and genius as diseases in the same sense as we speak of scarlet fever or tuberculosis or general paralysis as diseases. Every congenital abnormality is doubtless due to a peculiarity in the sperm or oval elements or in the mingling or to some disturbance in the early development. But the same may doubtless be said of the normal dissimilarities between brothers and sisters. It is quite true that any of these aberrations may be due to antenatal disease, but to call them abnormal does not back that question. If it is thought that any authority is needed to support this view, we can scarcely find a weightier than that of Virchow, who repeatedly insisted on the right use of the word anomaly, and who taught that, though an anomaly may constitute a predisposition to disease, the study of anomalies, pathology, as he called it, teratology, as we may perhaps prefer to call it, is not the study of disease, which he termed nosology. The study of the abnormal is perfectly distinct from the study of the morbid. Virchow considers that the region of the abnormal is the region of pathology, and that the study of disease must be regarded distinctly as nosology. Whether we adopt this terminology, or whether we consider the study of the abnormal as part of teratology, is a secondary matter, not affecting the right understanding of the term anomaly, and its due differentiation from the term disease. At the Innsbruck meeting of the German Anthropological Society in 1894, Virchow thus expressed himself. In old days, an anomaly was called pathos, and in this sense every departure from the norm is for me a pathological event. If we have ascertained such a pathological event, we are further led to investigate what pathos was the special cause of it. This cause may be, for example, an external force or a chemical substance or a physical agent producing in the normal condition of the body a change, an anomaly, pathos. This can become hereditary under some circumstances, and then become the foundation for certain small hereditary characters which are propagated in a family. In themselves they belong to pathology, even although they produce no injury. For I must remark that pathological does not mean harmful. It does not indicate disease. Disease in Greek is nosos, and it is nosology that is concerned with disease. The pathological under some circumstances can be advantageous. Correspondenzblatt Deutsche Gesellschaft für Anthropologie, 1894. These remarks are of interest when we are attempting to find the wider bearings of such an anomaly as sexual inversion. This same distinction has more recently been emphasized by Professor Aschoff, Deutsche Medizinische Wochenschrift, February 3, 1910, British Medical Journal, April 9, 1910, page 892, as against Ribert and others who would unduly narrow the conception of pathos. Aschoff points out that, not merely for the sake of precision and uniformity of terminology, but of clear thinking, it is desirable that we should retain a distinction in regard to which Galen and the ancient physicians were very definite. They use pathos as the wider term involving affection, affectio, in general, not necessarily impairment of vital tissue. When that was involved, there was nosos, disease. A word may be said as to the connection between sexual inversion and degeneration. In France especially, since the days of Morel, the stigmata of degeneration are much spoken of. Sexual inversion is frequently regarded as one of them, i.e. as an episodic syndrome of hereditary disease, taking its place beside other psychic stigmata such as kleptomania and pyromania. Kraft Ebing long so regarded inversion. It is the view of Magnan, one of the earliest investigators of homosexuality, and it was adopted by Möbius. Strictly speaking, the invert is degenerate. He has fallen away from the genus. So is a colorblind person. But Morel's conception of degenerescence has unfortunately been coarsened and vulgarized. As it now stands, we gain little or no information by being told that a person is a degenerate. It is only, as Nicky constantly argued, when we find a complexus of well-marked abnormalities that we are fairly justified in asserting that we have to deal with a condition of degeneration. Inversion is sometimes found in such a condition. I have indeed already tried to suggest that a condition of diffused minor abnormality may be regarded as a basis of congenital inversion. In other words, 
inversion is bound up with a modification of the secondary sexual characters but these anomalies and modifications are not invariable and are not usually of a serious character inversion is rare in the profoundly degenerate it is undesirable to call these modifications stigmata of degeneration a term which threatens to disappear from scientific terminology to become a mere term of literary and journalistic abuse so much may be said concerning a conception or a phrase of which far too much has been made in popular literature at the best it remains vague and unfitted for scientific use it is now widely recognized that we gain little by describing inversion as a degeneration necker who attached significance to the stigma of degeneration when numerous was especially active in pointing out that inverts are not degenerate and frequently returned to this point Löwenfeld, freud hirschfeld bloch rohleder all rejected the conception of sexual inversion as a degeneracy Molly is still unable to abandon altogether the position that since inversion involves a disharmony between psychic disposition and physical conformation we must regard it as morbid but he recognizes like kraft ebbing that it is properly viewed as being on the level of a deformity that is an abnormality comparable to physical hermaphroditism a moll sexuelle zwischenstufen zeitschrift für ärztliche fortbildung number twenty four nineteen o four Necker repeatedly emphasizes the view that inversion is a continuously non-morbid abnormality. Thus, in the last year of his life, he wrote Zeitschrift für die gesamte Neurologie und Psychiatrie, Volume 15, Heft 5, 1913. We must not conceive of homosexuality as a degeneration or a disease, but at most an abnormality due to a disturbance of development. Löwenfeld, always a cautious and sagacious clinical observer, agreeing with Necker and Hirschfeld regards inversion as certainly an abnormality but not therefore morbid it may be associated with disease and degeneration but is usually simply a variation from the norm not to be regarded as morbid or degenerate and not diminishing the value of the individual as a member of society löwenfeld über die sexuelle konstitution 1911 page 166 also zeitschrift für sexualwissenschaft february 1908 and sexualprobleme april 1908 Aletrino of Amsterdam pushes the view that inversion is a non-morbid abnormality to an undue extreme by asserting that the uranist is a normal variety of the species Homo sapiens. Uranism et Degeneration's Archive d'Anthropologie Criminelle, August to September 1908. Inversion may be regarded as, in the correct sense of the word here adopted, a pathological abnormality, but not as an anthropological human variety comparable to the negro or the mongolian man for further opinions in favor of inversion as an anomaly see hirschfeld die homosexualität page three hundred eighty eight its sequence sexual inversion therefore remains a congenital anomaly to be classed with other congenital abnormalities which have psychic concomitants at the very least such congenital abnormality usually exists as a predisposition to inversion it is probable that many persons go through the world with a congenital predisposition to inversion which always remains latent and unroused in others the instinct is so strong that it forces its own way in spite of all obstacles in others again the predisposition is weaker and a powerful exciting cause plays the predominant part we are thus led to the consideration of the causes that excite the latent predisposition a great variety of causes has been held to excite the sexual inversion. It is only necessary to mention those which I have found influential. The first to come before us is our school system, with its segregation of boys and girls apart from each other during the periods of puberty and adolescence. Many inverts have not been to school at all, and many who have been pass through school life without forming any passionate or sexual relationship but there remain a large number who date the development of homosexuality from the influences and examples of school life the impressions received at the time are not less potent because they are often purely sentimental and without any obvious sensual admixture whether they are sufficiently potent to generate permanent inversion alone may be doubtful but if it is true that in early life the sexual instincts are less definitely determined than when adolescence is complete it is conceivable though unproved that a very strong impression acting even on a normal organism may cause a rest of sexual development on the psychic side another exciting cause of inversion is seduction by this i mean the initiation of the young boy or girl by some older and more experienced person in whom inversion is already developed 
and who is seeking the gratification of the abnormal instinct. This appears to be a not uncommon incident in the early history of sexual inverts, that such seduction, sometimes an abrupt and inconsiderate act of mere sexual gratification, could by itself produce a taste for homosexuality is highly improbable. In individuals not already predisposed, it is far more likely to produce disgust, as it did in the case of the youthful Rousseau. He only can be seduced, as Moore puts it, who is capable of being seduced. No doubt it frequently happens in these, as so often in more normal seductions, that the victim has offered a voluntary or involuntary invitation. Another exciting cause of inversion, to which little importance is usually attached, but which I find to have some weight, is disappointment in normal love. It happens that a man in whom the homosexual instinct is yet only latent, or at all events held in a state of repression, tries to form a relationship with a woman. This relationship may be ardent on one or both sides, but, often, doubtless, from the latent homosexuality of the lover, it comes to nothing. Such love disappointments in a more or less acute form occur at some time or another to nearly everyone. But in these persons the disappointment with one woman constitutes motive strong enough to disgust the lover with the whole sex and to turn his attention toward his own sex. It is evident that the instinct which can thus be turned round can scarcely be strong, and it seems probable that in some of these cases the episode of normal love simply serves to bring home to the invert the fact that he is not made for normal love. In other cases, it seems, especially those that are somewhat feeble-minded and unbalanced, a love disappointment really does poison the normal instinct, and a more or less impotent love for women becomes an equally impotent love for men. The prevalence of homosexuality among prostitutes may be, to a large extent, explained by a similar and better founded disgust with normal sexuality. These three influences, therefore, example at school, seduction, disappointment in normal love, all of them drawing the subject away from the opposite sex and concentrating him on his own sex, are exciting causes of inversion but they require a favorable organic predisposition to act on, while there are a large number of cases in which no exciting cause at all can be found, but in which, from earliest childhood, the subject's interest seem to be turned on his own sex and continues to be so turned throughout life. At this point I conclude the analysis of the psychology of sexual inversion as it presents itself to me. I have sought only to bring out the more salient points, neglecting minor points, neglecting also those groups of inwards who may be regarded as of secondary importance. The average inward, moving in ordinary society, is a person of average general health, though very frequently with hereditary relationships that are markedly neurotic. He is usually the subject of a congenital predisposing abnormality or complexes of minor abnormalities, making it difficult or impossible for him to feel sexual attraction to the opposite sex and easy to feel sexual attraction to his own sex. This abnormality either appears spontaneously from the first by development or arrest of development, or it is called into activity by some accidental circumstance. End of chapter 6 Recorded by Julian Niedermeyer Chapter 7 of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2. By Havelock Ellis. Chapter 7. Conclusions. Part 1. Having now completed the psychological analysis of the sexual invert, so far as I have been able to study him, it only remains to speak briefly of the attitude of society and the law. First, however, a few words as to the medical and hygienic aspects of inversion. The preliminary question of the prevention of homosexuality is in too vague a position at present to be profitably discussed. So far as the really congenital invert is concerned, prevention can have but small influence but sound social hygiene should render difficult the acquisition of homosexual perversity, or what has been termed pseudo-homosexuality. It is the school which is naturally the chief theatre of immature and temporary homosexual manifestations, partly because school life largely coincides with the period during which the sexual impulse frequently tends to be undifferentiated and partly because in the traditions of large and old schools 
an artificial homosexuality is often deeply rooted. Homosexuality in English schools has already been briefly referred to in Chapter 3. As a precise and interesting picture of the phenomena in French schools, I may mention a story by Albert Nortal, Les Adolescents Passionnés, 1913, written immediately after the author left college, though not published until more than twenty-five years later, and clearly based on personal observation and experience. As regards German schools, see, for example, Moll, Untersuchungen über die Libido Sexualis, page 449 and following, and for sexual manifestations in early life generally, the same author's Sexual Life of the Child. Also, Hirschfeld, Jahrbuch für sexuelle Schüssenstufen, Volume 5, 1903, page 47 and further, and, for references, Hirschfeld, Die Homosexualität, page 46 and further. While much may be done by physical hygiene and other means to prevent the extension of homosexuality in schools, it is impossible, and even undesirable, to repress absolutely the emotional manifestations of sex in either boys or girls who have reached the age of puberty. It must always be remembered that profoundly rooted organic impulses cannot be effectually combated by direct methods. Writing of a period two centuries ago, Casanova, relating his early life as a seminarist trained to the priesthood, describes the precautions taken to prevent the youths entering each other's beds, and points out the folly of such precautions. As that master of the human heart remarks, such prohibitions intensify the very evil they are intended to prevent by invoking in its aid the impulse to disobedience natural to every child of Adam and Eve, and the observation has often been repeated by teachers since. We probably have to recognize that a way to render such manifestations wholesome, as well as to prepare for the relationships of later life, is the adoption, so far as possible, of the method of co-education of the sexes. Not, of course, necessarily involving identity of education for both sexes since a certain amount of association between the sexes helps to preserve the healthiness of the sexual-emotional attitude. Association between the sexes will not, of course, prevent the development of congenital inversion. In this connection it is pointed out by Beth that it was precisely in Sparta and Lesbos, where homosexuality was most ideally cultivated, that the sexes, so far as we know, associated more freely than in any other Greek state. The question of the treatment of homosexuality must be approached with discrimination, caution, and skepticism. Nowadays we can have but little sympathy with those who, at all costs, are prepared to cure the invert. There is no sound method of cure in radical cases. At one time the seemingly very radical method of castration was advocated, and occasionally carried out, as in the case I have recorded in a previous chapter. History 26. Like all methods of treatment, it is sometimes believed to have been successful by those who carried it out. Usually, after a short period, it is found to be unsuccessful, and in some cases the condition, especially the mental condition, is rendered worse. It is not difficult to understand why this should be. Sexual inversion is not a localized genital condition. It is a diffused condition, and firmly imprinted on the whole psychic state. There may be reasons for castration, or the slighter operation of vasectomy, but, although sexual tension may be thereby diminished, no authority now believes that any such operation will affect the actual inversion. Castration of the body in adult age cannot be expected to produce castration of the mind. Moll, Ferry, Necke, Bloch, Rohleder, Hirschfeld, are all either opposed to castration for inversion, or very doubtful as to any beneficial results. In a case communicated to me by Dr. Schufeld, an invert had himself castrated at the age of twenty-six to diminish sexual desire, make himself more like a woman, and to stop growth of beard. But the only apparent physical effect, he wrote, quote, was to increase my weight ten percent and render me a semi-invalid for the rest of my life. 
after two years my sexuality decreased, but that may have been due to satiety or to advancing years. I was also rendered more easily irritated over trifles and more vengeful. Terrible criminal auto-suggestions came into my head, never experienced before. End quote. Ferré, Revue de Chirurgie, March 10, 1905, published the case of an invert of English origin who had been castrated. The inverted impulse remained unchanged, as well as sexual desire and the aptitude for erection. But neurasthenic symptoms, which had existed before, were aggravated. He felt less capable to resist his impulses, became migratory in his habits of life, and addicted to the use of laudanum. In a case recorded by C. H. Hughes, alienist and neurologist, August 1914, the results were less unsatisfactory. In this case, the dorsal nerve of the penis was first excised, without any result. See also Alienist and Neurologist, February 1904, page 70, as regards worse than useless results of cutting the pudic nerve. And a year or so later, the testes were removed, and the patient gained tranquillity and satisfaction. His homosexual inclinations appeared to go, and he began to show inclination for asexualized women, being specially anxious to meet with a woman whose ovaries had been removed on account of inversion. Reference may also be made to Necke, Die ersten Kastrationen aus sozialen Gründen auf europäischen Boden, Neurologisches Zentralblatt, 1909, Number 5, and E. Wilhelm in Juristis Psychiatrische Grenzfragen, Volume 8, Heft 6 and 7, 1911. More trust has usually been placed in the psychotherapeutical than the surgical treatment of homosexuality. At one time, hypnotic suggestion was carried out very energetically on homosexual subjects. Kraft Ebbing seems to have been the first distinguished advocate of hypnotism for application to the homosexual. Dr. von Schrenk Notzing displayed special zeal and persistency in this treatment. He undertook to treat even the most pronounced cases of inversion by courses lasting more than a year, and involving, in at least one case, nearly 150 hypnotic sittings. He prescribed frequent visits to the brothel, previous to which the patient took large doses of alcohol. By prolonged manipulations, a prostitute endeavored to excite erection, a process attended with varying results. It appears that in some cases this course of treatment was attended by a certain sort of success, to which an unlimited good will on the part of the patient, it is needless to say, largely contributed. The treatment was, however, usually interrupted by continual backsliding to homosexual practices, and sometimes, naturally, the cure involved a venereal disorder. The patient was enabled to marry and to beget children. It is a method of treatment which seems to have found few imitators. This we need not regret. The histories I have recorded in previous chapters show that it is not uncommon for even a pronounced invert to be able sometimes to affect coitus. It often becomes easy if at the time he fixes his thoughts on images connected with his own sex. But the perversion remains unaffected. The subject is merely, as one of Moll's inverts expressed it, practicing masturbation per vaginum. Such treatment is a training in vice, and, as Rafalovich points out, the invert is simply perverted and brought down to the vicious level which necessarily accompanies perversity. There can be no doubt that in slight and superficial cases of homosexuality, suggestion may really exert an influence. We can scarcely expect it to exert such influence when the homosexual tendency is deeply rooted in an organic inborn temperament. In such cases, indeed, the subject may resist suggestion even when in the hypnotic state. This is pointed out by Moll, a great authority on hypnotism, and with much experience of its application to homosexuality but never inclined to encourage an exaggerated notion of its efficacy in this field. Forel, who was also an authority on hypnotism, was equally doubtful as to its value in relation to inversion, especially in clearly inborn cases. Kraft Ebing at the end said little about it, and Necke, who was himself without faith in this method of treating inversion, 
stated that he had been informed by the last homosexual case treated by Kraft Ebbing by hypnotism that, in spite of all good will on the patient's side, the treatment had been quite useless. Ferry also had no belief in the efficacy of suggestive treatment, nor has Mersbach, nor Rohleder. Numa Praetorius states that the homosexual subjects he is acquainted with, who had been so treated, were not cured, and Hirschfeld remarks that the inverts, so-called cured by hypnotism, were either not cured or not inverted. Moll has shown his doubts as to the wide applicability of suggestive therapeutics in homosexuality by developing in recent years what he terms association therapy. In nearly all perverse individuals, he points out, there is a bridge, more or less weak, no doubt, which leads to the normal sexual life. By developing such links of association with normality, Moll believes, it may be possible to exert a healing influence on the homosexual. Thus, a man who is attracted to boys may be brought to love a boyish woman. Indications of this kind have long been observed and utilized, though not developed into a systematic method of treatment. In the case of bisexual individuals, or of a youthful subject whose homosexuality is not fully developed, it is probable that this method is beneficial. It is difficult to believe, however, that it possesses any marked influence on pronounced and developed cases of inversion. Somewhat the same aim as Moll's association therapy, though on the basis of a more elaborate theory, is sought by Freud's psychoanalytic method of treating homosexuality. For the psychoanalytic theory, to which reference was made in the previous chapter, the congenital element of inversion is a rare and usually unimportant factor. The chief part is played by perverse psychic mechanisms. It is the business of psychoanalysis to straighten these out, and from the bisexual constitution which is regarded as common to everyone, to bring into the foreground the heterosexual elements, and so to reconstruct a normal personality, developing new sexual ideals from the patient's own latent and subconscious nature. Sadger has especially occupied himself with the psychoanalytic treatment of homosexuality, and claims many successes. Sadger admits that there are many limits to the success of his treatment, and that it cannot affect the inborn factors of homosexuality when present. Other psychoanalysts are less sanguine as to the cure of inversion. Stekel appears to have stated that he has never seen a complete cure by psychoanalysis, and Ferenesi is not able to give a good account of the results, especially as regards what he terms obsessional homosexuality. He states that he has never succeeded in effecting a complete cure although obsessions in general are especially amenable to psychoanalysis. I have met with at least two homosexual persons who had undergone psychoanalytic treatment and found it beneficial. One, however, was bisexual, so that the difficulties in the way of the success, granting it to be real, were not serious. In the other case, the inversion persisted after treatment, exactly the same as before. The benefit he received was due to the fact that he was enabled to understand himself better and to overcome some of his mental difficulties. The treatment, therefore, in his case, was not a method of cure, but of psychic hygiene, of what Hirschfeld would call adaptation therapy. There can be no doubt that, even if we put aside all effort at cure and regard an invert's condition as inborn and permanent, a large and important field of treatment here still remains. As we have seen in the two previous chapters, sexual inversion cannot be regarded as essentially an insane or psychopathic state. But it is frequently associated with nervous conditions which may be greatly benefited by hygiene and treatment, without any attempt at all to overcome a homosexual attitude which may be too deeply rooted to be changed. The invert is specially liable to suffer from a high degree of neurasthenia, often involving much nervous weakness and irritability, loss of self-control, and genital hyperesthesia. Hirschfeld finds that over 67% inverts suffer from nervous troubles, and among the cases dealt with in the present study, as shown in Chapter 5, slight nervous functional disturbances are very common. These are conditions which may be ameliorated, and they may be treated in much the same way as if no inversion existed, by physical and mental tonics, or, if necessary, sedatives, 
by regulated gymnastics and out-of-door exercises, and by occupations which employ, without overexerting the mind. Very great and permanent benefit may be obtained by a prolonged course of such mental and physical hygiene. The associated neurasthenic conditions may be largely removed with the morbid fears, suspicions, and irritabilities that are usually part of neurasthenia, and the invert may be brought into a fairly wholesome and tonic condition of self-control. The inversion is not thus removed, but if the patient is still young, and if the perversion does not appear to be deeply rooted in the organism, it is probable that, provided his own good will is aiding, general hygienic measures, together with removal to a favorable environment, may gradually lead to the development of the normal sexual impulse. If it fails to do so, it becomes necessary to exercise great caution in recommending stronger methods. Purely platonic association with the other sex, Moll points out, quote, leads to better results than any prescribed attempt at coitus, end quote. For even when such attempt is successful, it is not usually possible to regard the results with much satisfaction. Not only is the acquisition of the normal instinct by an invert very much on a level with the acquisition of a vice, but probably it seldom succeeds in eradicating the original inverted instinct. What usually happens is that the person becomes capable of experiencing both impulses, not a specially satisfactory state of things. It may be disastrous, especially if it leads to marriage, as it may do in an inverted man, or still more easily in an inverted woman. The apparent change does not turn out to be deep, and the invert's position is more unfortunate than his original position, both for himself and for his wife. It may be observed in the histories brought forward in Chapter 3 that the position of married inverts, we must of course put aside the bisexual, is usually more distressing than that of the unmarried. Among my cases, 14% are married. Hirschfeld finds that 16% of inverts are married, and 50% are impotent. He is unable to find a single cure of homosexuality, and seldom any improvement due to marriage. Nearly always the impulse remains unaffected. The invert's happiness is, however, often affected for the worse, and not least by the feeling that he is depriving his wife of happiness. An invert who had left his country through fear of arrest, and married a rich woman who was in love with him, said to Hirschfeld, Five years' imprisonment would not have been worse than one year of marriage. In a marriage of this kind, the homosexual partner and the normal partner, however ignorant of sexual matters, are both conscious, often with equal pain, that, even in the presence of affection and esteem and the best will in the world, there is something lacking. The instinctive and emotional element, which is the essence of sexual love and springs from the central core of organic personality, cannot voluntarily be created or even assumed. For the sake of the possible offspring, also, marriage is to be avoided. It is sometimes entirely for the sake of children that the invert desires to marry. But it must be pointed out that homosexuality is undoubtedly in many cases inherited. Often, it is true, the children turn out fairly well, but, in many cases, they bear witness that they belong to a neurotic and failing stock. Hirschfeld goes so far as to say that it is always so, and concludes that from the eugenic standpoint, the marriage of a homosexual person is always very risky. In a large number of cases, such marriages prove sterile. The tendency to sexual inversion in eccentric and neurotic families seems merely to be nature's merciful method of winding up a concern which, from her point of view, has ceased to be profitable. As a rule, inverts have no desire to be different from what they are, and, if they have any desire for marriage, it is usually only momentary. Very pathetic appeals for help are, however, sometimes made. I may quote from a letter addressed to me by a gentleman who desired advice on this matter. Quote, in part, I write to you as a moralist, and, in part, as to a physician. Dr. Q has published a book in which, without discussion, Hypnotic treatment of such cases was reported as successful. I am eager to know if your opinion remains what it was. This new assurance comes from a man whose moral firmness and delicacy are unquestionable, but you will easily imagine how one might shrink from the implantation of new impulses in the unconscious self 
since newly created inclinations might disturb the conditions of life. At any rate, in my ignorance of hypnotism, I fear that the effort to give the normal instinct might lead to marriage without the assurance that the normal instinct would be stable. I write, therefore, to explain my present condition and crave your counsel. It is with the greatest reluctance that I reveal the closely guarded secret of my life. I have no other abnormality, and have not hitherto betrayed my abnormal instinct. I have never made any person the victim of passion. Moral and religious feelings were too powerful. I have found my reverence for other souls a perfect safeguard against any approach to impurity. I have never had sexual interest in women. Once I had a great friendship with a beautiful and noble woman, without any mixture of sexual feeling on my part. I was ignorant of my condition, and had the bitter regret of having caused in her a hopeless love, proudly and tragically concealed to her death. My friendships with men, younger men, have been coloured by passion, against which I have fought continually. The shame of this has made life a hell, and the horror of this abnormality, since I came to know it as such, has been an enemy to my religious faith. Here there could be no case of a divinely given instinct which I was to learn to use in a rational and chaste fashion under the control of spiritual loyalty. The power which gave me life seemed to insist on my doing that for which the same power would sting me with remorse. If there is no remedy, I must either cry out against the injustice of this life of torment between nature and conscience, or submit to the blind trust of baffled ignorance. If there is a remedy, life will not seem to be such an intolerable ordeal. I am not pleading that I must succumb to impulse. I do not doubt that a pure celibate life is possible so far as action is concerned. But I cannot discover that friendship with younger men can go on uncolored by a sensuous admixture which fills me with shame and loathing. The gratification of passion, normal or abnormal, is repulsive to aesthetic feeling. I am nearly forty-two, and I have always diverted myself from personal interests that threatened to become dangerous to me. More than a year ago, however, a new fate seemed to open to my unhappy and lonely life. I became intimate with a young man of twenty, of the rarest beauty of form and character. I am confident that he is and always has been pure. He lives an exalted moral and religious life, dominated by the idea that he and all men are partners of the divine nature, and able, in the strength of that nature, to be free from evil. I believe him to be normal. He shows pleasure in the society of attractive young women, and in an innocent, light-hearted way refers to the time when he may be able to marry. He is a general favourite, but turned to me as to a friend and teacher." He is poor, and it was possible for me to guarantee him a good education. I began to help him from the longings of a lonely life. I wanted a son and a friend in my inward desolation. I craved the companionship of this pure and happy nature. I felt such a reverence for him that I hoped to find the sensuous element in me purged away by his purity. I am, indeed, utterly incapable of doing him harm. I am not morally weak. Nevertheless, the sensuous element is there, and it poisons my happiness. He is ardently affectionate and demonstrative. He spends the summers with me in Europe, and the tenderness he feels for me has prompted him at times to embrace and kiss me, as he always has done to his father. Of late I have begun to fear that without will or desire I may injure the springs of feeling in him, especially if it is true that the homosexual tendency is latent in most men. The love he shows me is my joy— but a poisoned joy. It is the bread and wine of life to me, but I dare not think what his ardent affection might ripen into. I can go on fighting the battle of good and evil in my attachment to him, but I cannot define my duty to him. To shun him would be cruelty, and would belie his trust in human fidelity. Without my friendship he will not take my money, the condition of a large career." I might, indeed, explain to him what I explained to you, but the ordeal and shame are too great, and I cannot see what good it would do. If he has the capacity of homosexual feeling, he might be violently stimulated. If he is incapable of it, he would feel repulsion. Suppose, then, that I should seek hypnotic treatment. I still do not know what tricks an abnormal nature might play me when diverted by suggestion. 
I might lose the joy of this friendship without any compensation. I'm afraid. I am afraid. Might I not be influenced to shun the only persons who inspire unselfish feeling? Bear with this account of my story. Many virtues are easy for me, and my life is spent in pursuits of culture. Alas, that all the culture with which I am credited, all the prayers and aspirations, all the strong will and heroic resolves have not rid my nature of this evil bent. What I long for is the right to love, not for the mere physical gratification, for the right to take another into the arms of my heart and profess all the tenderness I feel, to find my joy in planning his career with him, as one who is rightfully and naturally entitled to do so. I crave this, since I cannot have a son. I leave the matter here. When I read what I have written, I see how pointless it is. It is possible, indeed, that brooding over my personal calamity magnifies in my mind the sense of danger to this friend through me, and that I only need to find the right relation of friendliness, coupled with aloofness, which will secure him against any too ardent attachment. Certainly I have no fear that I shall forget myself. Yet two things array themselves on the other side. I rebel inwardly against the necessity of isolating myself as if I were a pestilence, and I rebel against the taint of sensuous feeling. The normal man can feel that his instinct is no shame when the spirit is in control. I know that through the consciousness of others my instinct itself would be a shame and a baseness, and I have no tendency to construct a moral system for myself. I have, to be sure, moments when I declare to myself that I will have my sensuous gratification as well as other men, but the moment I think of the wickedness of it, the rebellion is soon over. The disesteem of self, the sense of taint, the necessity of withdrawing from happiness lest I communicate my taint, that is a spiritual malady which makes the ground tone of my existence one of pain and melancholy. Should you have only some moral consolation without the promise of medical assistance, I should feel grateful. End, quote. End of chapter 7, part 1 Chapter 7 of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2, by Havelock Ellis. Chapter 7. Conclusions. Part 2. In such a case as this, one can do little more than advise the sufferer that, however painful his lot may be, it is not without its consolations, and that he would be best advised to pursue, as cheerfully as may be, the path that he has already long since marked out for himself. The invert sometimes fails to realize that for no man with high moral ideals, however normal he may be, is the conduct of life easy, and that if the invert has to be satisfied with affection without passion, and to live a life of chastity, he is doing no more than thousands of normal men have done, voluntarily and contentedly. As to hypnotism in such a case as this, it is altogether unreasonable to expect that suggestion will supplant the deeply rooted organic impulses that have grown up during a lifetime. We may thus conclude that in the treatment of inversion the most satisfactory result is usually obtained when it is possible, by direct and indirect methods, to reduce the sexual hyperesthesia which frequently exists, and by psychic methods to refine and spiritualize the inverted impulse so that the invert's natural perversion may not become a cause of acquired perversity in others. The invert is not only the victim of his own abnormal obsession, he is the victim of social hostility. We must seek to distinguish the part in his sufferings due to these two causes. When I review the cases I have brought forward, and the mental history of inverts I have known, I am inclined to say that if we can enable an invert to be healthy, self-restrained and self-respecting, we have often done better than to convert him into the mere feeble simulacrum of a normal man. An appeal to the pederastia of the best Greek days, and the dignity, temperance, even chastity which it involved, will sometimes find a ready response in the emotional, enthusiastic nature of the congenital invert. 
Plato's dialogues have frequently been found a source of great help and consolation by inverts. The manly love celebrated by Walt Whitman in Leaves of Grass, although it may be of more doubtful value for general use, furnishes a wholesome and robust ideal to the invert who is insensitive to normal ideals. Among recent books, Ioleus, an anthology of friendship, edited by Edward Carpenter, may be recommended. A similar book in German, of a more extended character, is Lieblingmine und Freudesliebe in der Weltliteratur, edited by Elisa von Kupfer. Mention may also be made of the Freundschaft, 1912, of Baron von Gleichen Brusswurm, a sort of literary history of friendship without specific reference to homosexuality, although many writers of inverted tendency are introduced. Platon's Tagebücher are notable as a diary of an invert of high character and ideals. The volumes of the Jahrbuch für sexuelle Schwissenstufen contain many studies bearing on the ideal and aesthetic aspects of homosexuality. Various modern poets of high ability have given expression to emotions of exalted or passionate friendship toward individuals of the same sex, whether or not such friendship can properly be termed homosexual. It is scarcely necessary to refer to In Memoriam, in which Tennyson enshrined his affection for his early friend Arthur Hallam, and developed a picture of the universe on the basis of that affection. The poems of Edward Crackcroft Lefroy are notable. And Mr. John Gambrell Nicholson has privately issued several volumes of verse, a chapter of Southernwood, a garland of Let's Love, etc., showing delicate charm combined with high technical skill. Some books, mainly or entirely written in prose, may fairly be included in the same group. Such are In the Key of Blue, by John Eddington Simmons, and The Memoirs of Arthur Hamilton, published anonymously by a well-known author, a. C. Benson, in which on somewhat platonic lines the idea is worked out that the individual sufferer must pass from the love of one fair form to the love of abstract beauty, and from the contemplation of his own suffering to the consideration of the roots of all human suffering. As regards the modern poetic literature of feminine homosexuality, there is probably nothing to put beside the various volumes, pathetic in their brave simplicity and sincerity, of René Vivien, see before, page 200. Some other feminine singers of homosexuality have cautiously thrown a veil of heterosexuality over their songs. Novels of a more or less definitely homosexual tone are now very numerous in English, French, German, and other languages. In English, the homosexuality is for the most part veiled, and the narrative deals largely with school life and boys, in order that the emotional and romantic character of the relations described may appear more natural. Thus, Tim, an anonymously published book by H. O. Sturgis, 1891, describes the devotion of a boy to an older boy at Eton, and his death at an early age. Jasper Tristram, by A. W. Clark, 1899, again, is a well-written story of a schoolboy friendship of homosexual tone. A boy is represented as feeling attraction to boys who are like girls, and a girl became attractive to the hero because she is like a boy, and recalls her brother, whom he had formerly loved. The Garden God, A Tale of Two Boys, by Forrest Reed, 1905, is another rather similar book, in its way a charming and delicately written idyll. Imre, A Memorandum, 1906, by Xavier Maine, the pseudonym of an American author who has also written The Intersexes, privately issued at Naples, is a book of a different class, representing the frankly homosexual passion of two mutually attracted men, an Englishman who is supposed to write the story, and a Hungarian officer. It embodies a notable narrative of homosexual development, which is probably more or less real. In French there are a number of novels dealing with homosexuality, sometimes sympathetically, sometimes with artistic indifference, sometimes satirically. André Guide, in Le Moraliste and other books, Rachilde, Madame Vallette, Willy, in the well-known Claudine series, may be mentioned, among other writers of more or less distinction, who have once or oftener dealt with homosexuality. Special reference should be made to the Belgian author Georg 
Ekwoud, whose Escal Vigor, prosecuted at Bruges on its publication, is a book of special power. The homosexual stories of Esbach, of which Lélu, 1902, is considered the best, are of a romantic and sentimental character. Lucien, 1910, by Binet Valmer, is a penetrating and scarcely sympathetic study of inversion. Nortal's Les Adolescents Passionnés, already mentioned on page 325, is a notably intimate and precise study of homosexuality in French schools. It would be easy to mention many others. In Germany, during recent years, many novels of homosexual character have been published. They are not usually, it would seem, of high literary character, but are sometimes notable as being more or less disguised narratives of real fact. Baudis, Aus eines Mannes Mädchenjahren, is said to be a faithful autobiography. Der neue Werther, eine hellenische Passionsgeschichte, by Narcissus, 1902, is also said to be authentic. Another book that may be mentioned is Konradin's Ein junger Platos, aus dem Leben eines Endbeistes, 1914. The German belletristic literature of homosexuality, as well as that of other countries, will be found adequately summarized and criticized by Numa Praetorius in the volumes of the Jahrbuch für sexuelle Schissenstufen. See also Hirschfeld's Die Homosexualität, pages 47 and 1018 and further. It is by some such method of self-treatment as this that most of the more highly intelligent men and women whose histories I have already briefly recorded have at last slowly and instinctively reached a condition of relative health and peace, both physical and moral. The method of self-restraint and self-culture, without self-repression, seems to be the most rational method of dealing with sexual inversion when that condition is really organic and deeply rooted. It is better that a man should be enabled to make the best of his own strong natural instincts with all their disadvantages than that he should be unsexed and perverted, crushed into a position which he has no natural aptitude to occupy. As both Rafalovich and Ferré have insisted, it is the ideal of chastity rather than of normal sexuality which the congenital invert should hold before his eyes. He may not have in him the making of l'homme moyen sensuel, he may have in him the making of a saint. What good work in the world the inverted may do is shown by the historical examples of distinguished inverts, and, while it is certainly true that these considerations apply chiefly to the finer-grained natures, the histories I have brought together suffice to show that such natures constitute a considerable proportion of inverts. The helplessly gross sexual appetite cannot thus be influenced but that remains true whether the appetite is homosexual or heterosexual, and nothing is gained by enabling it to feed on women as well as on men. A strictly ascetic life, it need scarcely be said, is with difficulty possible for all persons, either homosexual or heterosexual. It is, however, outside the province of the physician to recommend his inverted patients to live according to their homosexual impulses, even when those impulses seem to be natural to the person displaying them. The most that the physician is entitled to do, it seems to me, is to present the situation clearly, and leave to the patient the decision for which he must himself accept the responsibility. Forel goes so far as to say that he sees no reason why inverts should not build cities of their own and marry each other if they so please, since they can do no harm to normal adults, while children can be protected from them. Such notions are, however, too far removed from our existing social conventions to be worth serious consideration. The standpoint here taken up, it may be remarked, by no means denies to the invert a right to the fulfillment of his impulses. Numa Pretorius remarks, it would seem justly, that while the invert must properly be warned against unnatural sexual license, and while those who are capable of continence do well to preserve it, to deny all right to sexual activity to the invert merely causes those inverts who are incapable of self-control to throw recklessly aside all restraints. Zeitschrift für sexuelle Schissenstufen, Volume 8, 1906, page 726. The invert has the right to sexual indulgence, it may be, but he has also the duty to accept the full responsibility for his own actions, and the necessity to recognize the present attitude of the society he lives in. He cannot be advised to set himself in violent opposition to that society. 
the world will not be a tolerable place for pronounced inverts until they are better understood, and that will involve a radical change in general and even medical opinion. An inverted physician, of high character and successful in his profession, writes to me on this point, quote, the first and easiest thing to do, it seems to me, is to convince the medical profession that we unfortunate people are not only as sane, but as moral as our normal brothers, and that we are even more alive to the supreme necessity of self-control, necessary from every point of view, than they. It is not license we want, but justice. It is the cruelty and prejudice of convention which we wish to abolish." not the proper and just indignation of society with crimes against the social order. We want to make it possible for us to satisfy our inborn instincts, which are not concerned essentially with sexual acts, so-called, alone, without thereby becoming criminals. One of us, who would, under any circumstances, seduce a person of his own sex of immature age, and particularly one whose sexual complexion was unknown, deserves the severe punishment which would be meted out to a normal person who did the same to a young girl, but no more. While, so long as no public offence is given, there should be no penalty or obloquy, whatever, attached to sexual acts committed with full consent between mature persons. These acts may or may not be wrong and immoral, just as sexual acts between mature persons of different sexes may or may not be wrong or immoral but in neither case has the law any concern, and public opinion should make no distinction between the two. It is in the highest degree important that it should be clearly understood that we want no relaxation of moral obligations. At present, we suffer an inconceivably cruel wrong. End quote. We have always to remember, and there is indeed no possibility of forgetting, that the question of homosexuality is a social question. Within certain limits, the gratification of the normal sexual impulse, even outside marriage, arouses no general or profound indignation, and is regarded as a private matter. Rightly or wrongly, the gratification of the homosexual impulse is regarded as a public matter. This attitude is more or less exactly reflected in the law. Thus it happens that whenever a man is openly detected in a homosexual act, however exemplary his life may previously have been, however admirable it may still be in all other relations, every ordinary normal citizen, however licentious and pleasure-loving his own life may be, feels it a moral duty to regard the offender as hopelessly damned and to help in hounding him out of society. At very brief intervals, cases occur, and without reaching the newspapers are more or less widely known, in which distinguished men in various fields, not seldom clergymen, suddenly disappear from the country, or commit suicide, in consequence of some such exposure, or the threat of it. It is probable that many obscure tragedies could find their explanation in a homosexual cause. Some of the various tragic ways in which homosexual passions are revealed to society may be illustrated by the following communication from a correspondent, not himself inverted, who here narrates cases that came under his observation in various parts of the United States. The cases referred to will be known to many, but have disguised the names of persons and places. Quote, at the age of fourteen I was a chorister at Blank Church, whose choirmaster, an Englishman named M. W. M., was an accomplished man, seemingly a perfect gentleman and a devout churchman. He never seemed to care for the society of ladies, never mingled much with the men, but sought companionship with the choristers of my age. He frequently visited at the homes of his favourites to tea, and when he asked the parents' consent for George's or Frank's company on an excursion or to the theatre, and then to spend the night with him, such request was invariably granted. I shall ever remember my first night with him. He began by fondling and caressing me, quieting my alarm by assurances of not hurting me, and after invoking me to secrecy and with promises of many future pleasures, I consented to his desire or passion which he seemed to satisfy by an attempt at fellatio. Was this depravity? I would say no, after reading his subsequent confession, found in his room after his death by suicide. This was brought about by his two intimate relations with a rector's son, who contracted St. Vitus's dance, and in the delirium of a fever that followed from nervous exhaustion, told of him and his doings. 
A thorough investigation took place, and M. fled, a broken-hearted and disgraced man who, as the result of remorse, relentless persecution, and exposure through several years, ended his life by drowning himself. In his confession he spoke of having been raised under a very strong moral restraint, and having lived an exemplary life, with the exception of this strange desire that his willpower could not control. The next case is that of C. H., he came of an old family of brainy men, who have, and do yet, occupy prominent places in the pulpit and the bar, and was himself a gifted young attorney. I knew him intimately, as for six years he was a close neighbour, and we were associated in lodge work. He was an effeminate little fellow, height five feet two inches, weighed one hundred and five pounds, very near-sighted, and he had a light voice not a treble or falsetto, but still a voice that detracted materially from the beautiful rhetoric that flowed from his lips. He had served his country as its representative in the legislature, and had received the nomination for senator over a hard-fought political battle. The last canvas and speeches were made at a town which was in consequence crowded. That night H. had to occupy a room with a stranger named E., a travelling salesman. There were two beds in this room. Mr. E., on the following day, told several people that during the night he was awakened by H., who had come over to his bed and had his mouth on his person, and that he had threatened to kick him out of the room, but that H. pleaded with him and fell on his knees and swore that he had been overcome by a passion that he had heretofore controlled, and begged of him not to expose him. These facts coming to the notice of his opponents, within twenty-four hours, they hastened to take advantage of it by placarding H. as a second Oscar Wilde, and stating the facts as far as decency and the law allowed. H.'s friends came to him and gave him one of two alternatives. If guilty, either to kill himself or leave that section for ever. If not guilty, to slay his traducer, E. H. affirmed his innocence, and, in company with two friends, C. and J., took the train for blank. Learning there that E. was at a town twelve miles east, they hired a vast livery and drove over land. They found E. at the station, awaiting the arrival of a train. H., with a pistol, strode forward, and in his excitement said, "'You exposed me, did you?' Being near-sighted, his aim proved wide of the mark. E. sprang forward and grappled with H. for possession of the pistol, and was fired upon by C. and J., who shot him in the back. He expired in a few minutes his last statement being to the effect that H. was guilty as accused. H., C., and J. were sentenced to the penitentiary for life. During my six years' acquaintance with H., I knew of nothing derogatory to his character, nor has anyone ever come forward to say that on any other occasion he ever displayed this weakness. I know his early life had a pure atmosphere, as he was an only child and the idol of both his parents, who build high their hopes of his future success, and who survive this disgrace, but are broken-hearted. End of chapter 7, part 2。Chapter 7 of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2 。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kirk Ziegler. Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2, by Havelock Ellis. Chapter 7, Conclusions, Part 3. The next case is that of the Rev. T. W. Professor at the University of... Mr. W. is a scholarly gentleman, affable in his address, eloquent in his oratory, and a fine classical scholar. He was exposed by some of his students, who, to use a slang phrase, accused him of being a head worker. At his examination by the faculty, he confessed his weakness, and said he could not control his unholy passion. His resignation was accepted by both the church and the college, and he left. I know of a few other cases that have their peculiar traits, and am confident that these persons did not become possessed of this habit through the so-called indiscretions of youth, as in every case their early life was freer from contamination than that of ninety percent of the boys who, on reaching man's estate, have, like myself, 
no desire to deviate from the old-fashioned way formulated by our ancient sire Adam. It can scarcely be said that the consciousness of this attitude of society is favorable to the invert's attainment of a fairly sane and well-balanced state of mind. This is, indeed, one of the great difficulties in his way, and often causes him to waver between extremes of melancholia and egotistic exaltation. We regard all homosexuality with absolute and unmitigated disgust. We have been taught to venerate Alexander the Great, Epaminondas, Socrates, and other antique heroes, but they are safely buried in the remote past and do not affect our scorn of homosexuality in the present. It was in the fourth century at Rome that the strong modern opposition to homosexuality was first clearly formulated in law. The Roman race had long been decaying, sexual perversions of all kinds flourished, the population was dwindling. At the same time, Christianity, with its Judaic Pauline antagonism to homosexuality, was rapidly spreading. The statesmen of the day, anxious to quicken the failing pulses of national life, utilized this powerful Christian feeling. Constantine, Theodosius, and Valentinian all passed laws against homosexuality, the last, at all events, ordaining as penalty the vindicious flamme. But their enactments do not seem to have been strictly carried out. In the year 538, Justinian, professing terror of certain famines, earthquakes, and pestilences, in which he saw the mysterious recompense which was meet, prophesied by St. Paul, issued his edict condemning unnatural offenders to the sword, lest as the result of these impious acts, as the preamble to his novella 77 has it, whole cities should perish together with their inhabitants, for we are taught by Holy Scripture that through these acts cities have perished with the men in them. This edict, which Justinian followed up by a fresh ordinance to the same effect, constituted the foundation of legal enactment and social opinion concerning the matter in Europe for thirteen hundred years. In France, the Vindices Flamme survived to the last. St. Louis had handed over these sacrilegious offenders to the church to be burned. In 1750, two pederasts were burned in the Palace de Greve, and only a few years before the Revolution, a Capuchin monk named Pascal was also burned. After the Revolution, however, began a new movement, which has continued slowly and steadily ever since, though it still divides European nations into two groups. Justinian, Charlemagne, and St. Louis had insisted on the sin and sacrilege of sodomy as the ground for its punishment. It was doubtless largely as a religious offense that the Code Napoleon omitted to punish it. The French law makes a clear and logical distinction between crime on the one hand, vice and irreligion on the other, only concerning itself with the former. Homosexual practice in private between two consenting adult parties, whether men or women, are absolutely unpunished by the Code Napoleon and by French law of today. Only under three conditions does the homosexual act come under the cognizance of the law as a crime. 1. When there is outrage public à la pédère, for example, when the act is performed in public or with a possibility of witnesses. 2. When there is violence or absence of consent, in whatever degree the act may have been consummated. 3. When one of the parties is under age or unable to give valid consent, in some cases it appears possible to apply Article 334 of the Penal Code, directed against habitual excitation to debauch of young persons of either sex under the age of 21. This method of dealing with unnatural offenses has spread widely, at first because of the political influence of France, and more recently because such an attitude has commended itself on its merits. In Belgium, the law is similar to that of the Code Napoleon, as it is also in Italy, Spain, Portugal, Romania, Japan, and numerous South American lands. In Switzerland, the law is a little vague and very slightly in the different cantons, but it is not severe. In Geneva and some other cantons, there is no penalty. The general tendency is to inflict brief imprisonment when serious complaints have been lodged. 
and cases can sometimes be settled privately by the magistrate. The only large European countries in which homosexuality per se remains a penal offense appear to be Germany, Austria, Russia, and England. In several of the German states, such as Bavaria and Hanover, simple homosexuality formerly went unpunished. But when the laws of Prussia were in 1871 applied to the new German Empire, this ceased to be the case, and unnatural carnality between males became an offense against the law. This article of the German Code, section 175, has caused great discussion and much practical difficulty, because although the terms of the law make it necessary to understand by Wiedermacherlich Unzucht other practices besides Pedicatio, not every homosexual practice is included. It must be some practice resembling normal coitus. There is a widespread opinion that this article of the code should be abolished. It appears that at one time an authoritative committee pronounced in favor of this step, and their proposition came near adoption. The Austrian law is somewhat similar to the German, but it applies to women as well as to men. This is logical, for there is no reason why homosexuality should be punished in men and left unpunished in women. In Russia, the law against homosexual practices appears to be very severe, involving in some cases banishment to Siberia and deprivation of civil rights, but it can scarcely be rigorously executed. The existing law in England is severe but simple. Carnal knowledge of perenum of either man or a woman or an animal is punishable by a sentence of penal servitude with not less than three years or of imprisonment with not more than two years. Even gross indecency between males, however, privately committed, has been since 1885 a penal offense. The clause is open to criticism. With the omission of the words or private, it would be sound and in harmony with the most enlightened European legislation, but it must be pointed out that an act only becomes indecent when those who perform it or witness it regard it as indecent. The act which has brought each of us into the world is not indecent. It would become so if carried on in public. If two male persons, who have reached years of discretion, consent together to perform some act of sexual intimacy in private, no indecency has been committed. If one of the consenting parties subsequently proclaims the act, indecency may doubtless be created, as may happen also in the case of normal sexual intercourse. But it seems contrary to good policy that such proclamation should convert the act itself into a penal offense. Moreover, gross indecency between males usually means some form of mutual masturbation. No penal code regards masturbation as an offense, and there seems to be no sufficient reason why mutual masturbation should be so regarded. The main point to be ensured is that no boy or girl who has not reached years of discretion should be seduced or abused by an older person, and this point is equally well guaranteed on the basis introduced by the Code Napoleon, however shameful, disgusting, personally immoral, and indirectly antisocial it may be for two adult persons of the same sex, men or women, to consent together to perform an act of sexual intimacy in private, there is no sound or adequate ground for constituting such an act a penal offense by law. One of the most serious objections to the legal recognition of private gross indecency is the obvious fact that only in the rarest cases can such indecency become known to the police, and we thus perpetuate what is very much a legal farce. The breaking of a few laws, as Mole truly observes, regarding the German law, so often goes unpunished as this. It is the same in England, as is amply evidenced by the fact that, of the English sexual inverts, whose histories I have obtained, not one, so far as I am aware, has ever appeared in a police court on this charge. It may further be pointed out that legislation against homosexuality has no clear effect either in diminishing or increasing its prevalence. This must necessarily be so as regards to the kernel of the homosexual group, if we are to regard a considerable proportion of cases as congenital. 
In France, homosexuality per se has been untouched by the law for a century, yet it abounds, chiefly, it seems, among the lowest of the community. Although the law is silent, social feeling is strong, and when, as has been the case in one instance, a man of undoubted genius has his name associated with this perversion, it becomes difficult or impossible for the admirers of his work to associate with him personally. Very few cases of homosexuality have been recorded in France among the more intelligent classes. The literature of homosexuality is there little more than the literature of male prostitution, as described by police officials, and as carried on largely for the benefit of foreigners. In Germany and Austria, where the law against homosexuality is severe, it abounds also, perhaps to a much greater extent than in France. It certainly asserts itself more vigorously. A far greater number of cases have been recorded than in any other country, and the German literature of homosexuality is very extensive, often issued in popular form, and sometimes enthusiastically eulogistic. In England the law is exceptionally severe, yet, according to the evidence of those who have an international acquaintance with these matters, homosexuality is fully as prevalent as on the continent. Some would say that it is more so. Much the same is true of the United States, though there is less to be seen on the surface. It cannot, therefore, be said that legislative enactments have very much influence on the prevalence of homosexuality. The chief effect seems to be that the attempt at suppression arouses the finer minds among sexual inverts to undertake the enthusiastic defense of homosexuality while coarser minds are stimulated to cynical bravado. As regards the prevalence of homosexuality in the United States, I may quote from a well-informed American correspondent. The great prevalence of sexual inversion in America's cities is shown by the wide knowledge of its existence. Ninety-nine normal men out of a hundred have been accosted on the streets by inverts, or have among their acquaintances men whom they know to be sexually inverted. Everyone has seen inverts and knows what they are. The public attitude toward them is generally a negative one, indifference, amusement, contempt. The world of sexual inverts is indeed a large one in any American city, and it is a community distinctly organized, words, customs, traditions of its own, and every city has its numerous meeting places, certain churches where inverts congregate. Certain cafes well known for the inverted character of their patrons. Certain streets where at night every fifth man is an invert. The inverts have their own clubs with nightly meetings. These clubs are really dance halls attached to saloons and presided over by the proprietor of the saloon, himself almost invariably an invert, as are all the waiters and musicians. The frequenters of these places are male sexual inverts, usually ranging from seventeen to thirty years of age. Sightseers find no difficulty in gaining entrance. Truly, they are welcomed for the drinks they buy for the company and other reasons. Singing and dancing turns by certain favorite performers are the features of these gatherings, with much gossip and drinking at the small tables ranged along the four walls of the room. The abitwe of these places are, generally, inverts of the most profound type. For example, the completely feminine in voice and manners, with the characteristic hip motion in their walk. Though I have never seen any approach to feminine dress there, doubtless the desire for it is not wanting, and only police regulations relegate it to other occasions and places. You will rightly infer that the police know of these places and endure their existence for a consideration. It is not unusual for the inquiring stranger to be directed there by a policeman. The Oscar Wilde trial, see ante page 48, with its wide publicity and the fundamental nature of the questions it suggested, appears to have generally contributed to give definiteness and self-consciousness to the manifestations of homosexuality, and to have aroused inverts to take up a definite attitude. I have been assured in several quarters that this is so, and that since that case the manifestations of homosexuality have become more pronounced. One correspondent writes, 
Up to the time of the Oscar Wilde trial, I had not known what condition the law was. The moral question in itself, its relation to my own life and that of my friends, I reckoned I had solved. But now I had to ask myself how far I was justified in not only breaking the law, but in being the cause of a like breach in others, and others younger than myself. I have never allowed the dictum of the law to interfere with what I deem to be a moral development in any youth for whom I am responsible. I cannot say that the trial made me alter my course in life, of the rightness of which I was too convincingly persuaded, but it made me much more careful, and it probably sharpened my sense of responsibility for the young. Reviewing the results of the trial as a whole, it doubtless did incalculable harm, and it intensified our national vice of hypocrisy. But I think it also may have done some good in that it made those who, like myself, have thought and experienced deeply in the matter, and these must be no small few, ready to strike a blow when the time comes, for what we deem right, honorable, and clean. From America a lady writes with reference to the moral position of inverts, though without allusion to the wild trial. Inverts should have the courage and independence to be themselves and to demand an investigation. If one strives to live honorably and considers the greatest good to the greatest number, it is not a crime nor a disgrace to be an invert. I do not need the law to defend me, neither do I desire to have any concessions made for me, nor do I ask my friends to sacrifice their ideals for me. I too have ideals which I shall always hold, all that I desire and I claim it as my right, is the freedom to exercise this divine gift of loving, which is not a menace to society nor a disgrace to me. Let it once be understood that the average invert is not a moral degenerate nor a mental degenerate, but simply a man or a woman who is less highly specialized, less completely differentiated than other men and women, and I believe the prejudice against them will disappear, and if they live uprightly, they will surely win the esteem and consideration of all thoughtful people. I know what it means to be an invert, who feels himself set apart from the rest of mankind, to find one human heart who trusts him and understands him, and I know how almost impossible this is, and will be, until the world is made aware of these facts. But while the law has had no more influence in repressing abnormal sexuality than wherever it has tried to do so, it has had in repressing the normal sexual instinct, it has served to foster another offense. What is called blackmailing in England, chotas in France, erpressum in Germany. In other words, the extortion of money by threats of exposing some real or fictitious offense finds its chief field of activity in connection with homosexuality. No doubt the removal of the penalty against simple homosexuality does not abolish blackmailing, as the existence of this kind of chotas in France shows, but it renders its success less probable. On all these grounds and taking into consideration the fact that the tendency of modern legislation generally, and the consensus of authoritative opinion in all countries, are in this direction, it seems reasonable to conclude that neither sodomy for example, emissio membri in anum hominis vel mulieris, or gross indecency ought to be penal offenses, except under certain special circumstances. That is to say, that if two persons of either or both sexes, having reached years of discretion, privately consent to practice some perverted mode of sexual relationship, the law cannot be called upon to interfere. It should be the function of the law in this matter to prevent violence, to protect the young, and to preserve public order and decency. Whatever laws are laid down beyond this must be left to the individuals themselves, to the moralists, and to social opinion. At the same time, and while such a modification in the law seems to be reasonable, the change effected would be less considerable than may appear at first sight. In a very large proportion, indeed, of cases boys are involved. It is instructive to observe that in Leglutic's 246 cases, including victims and aggressors together, in France, 127, or more than half, were between the ages of 10 and 20 and 82, 
or exactly one-third, were between the ages of ten and fourteen. A very considerable field of operation is thus still left for the law, whatever proportion of cases may meet with no other penalty than social opinion. That, however, social opinion, law or no law, will speak with no uncertain voice is very evident. Once homosexuality was primarily a question of population or of religion. Now we hear little either of its economic aspects or of its sacrilegiousness. It is for us primarily a disgusting abomination, such as a matter of taste, of aesthetics, and while unspeakably ugly to the majority, it is proclaimed as beautiful by a small minority. I do not know that we need to find fault with this aesthetic method of judging homosexuality, but it scarcely lends itself to legal purposes. To indulge in violent denunciation of the disgusting nature of homosexuality, and to measure the sentence by the disgust aroused, or to regret as one English judge is reported to have regretted when giving sentence, that gross indecency is not punishable by death, is to import utterly foreign considerations into the matter. The judges who yield to this temptation would certainly never allow themselves to be consciously influenced on the bench by their political opinions. Yet aesthetic opinions are quite as foreign to law as political opinions. An act does not become criminal because it is disgusting. To eat excrement, as Mull remarks, is extremely disgusting, but it is not criminal. The confusion thus exists, even in the legal mind, between the disgusting and the criminal is additional evidence of the undesirability of the legal penalty for simple homosexuality. At the same time, it shows that social opinion is amply adequate to deal with the manifestations of inverted sexuality. So much for the legal aspects of sexual inversion. But while there can be no doubt about the amply adequate character of the existing social reaction to all manifestations of perverted sexuality, the question still remains how far not merely the law but also the state of public opinion should be modified in the light of such a psychological study as we have here undertaken. It is clear that this public opinion, molded chiefly or entirely with reference to gross vice, tends to be unduly violent in its reaction. What, then, is the reasonable attitude of society toward the congenital sexual invert? It seems to lie in the avoidance of two extremes. On the one hand, it cannot be expected to tolerate the invert who flouts his perversion in its face and assumes that, because he would rather take his pleasure with a soldier or a policeman than with their sisters, he is of finer clay than the vulgar herd. On the other, it might well refrain from crushing, with undiscerning ignorance beneath the burden of shame, the subject of an abnormality which, as we have seen, has not been found incapable of fine uses. Inversion is an aberration from the usual course of nature, but the clash of contending elements which must often mark the history of such a deviation results now and again, by no means infrequently, in nobler activities than those yielded by the vast majority who are born to consume the fruits of the earth. It bears, for the most part, its penalty in the structure of its own organism. We are bound to protect the helpless members of society against the invert. If we go farther and seek to destroy the invert himself before he has sinned against society, we exceed the warrant of reason and in doing so we may perhaps destroy also those children of the spirit which possess sometimes a greater worth than the children of the flesh. Here we may leave this question of sexual inversion. In dealing with it, I have sought to avoid that attitude of moral superiority which is so common in the literature of this subject, and have refrained from pointing out how loathsome this phenomenon is, or how hideous that. Such an attitude is as much out of place in scientific investigation as it is in judicial investigation, and may well be left to the amateur. The physician who feels nothing but disgust at the sight of disease is unlikely to bring either succor to his patients or instruction to his pupils. That the investigation we have here pursued is not only profitable to us in succoring the social organism and its members, 
but also in bringing light to the region of sexual psychology, is now, I hope, clear to every reader who has followed me to this point. There are a multitude of social questions which we cannot face squarely and honestly unless we possess such precise knowledge as has been here brought together concerning the part played by the homosexual tendency in human life. Moreover, the study of this perverted tendency stretches beyond itself. Or that art which you say adds to nature is an art that nature makes. Pathology is but physiology working under new conditions. The stream of nature still flows into the bent channel of sexual inversion, and still runs according to law. We have not wasted our time in this toilsome excursion. With the knowledge here gained, we are better equipped to enter upon the study of the wider questions of sex. End of chapter 7 Recording by Kirk Ziegler, Ogden, Utah Voiceovers by Kirk dot com Appendix A of Studies in the Psychology of Sex This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Geller Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2, by Havelock Ellis Appendix A, Homosexuality Among Tramps, by Josiah Flint I have made a rather minute study of the tramp class in the United States, England and Germany, but I know it best in the States. I have lived with the tramps there for eight consecutive months, besides passing numerous shorter periods in their company, and my acquaintance with them is nearly of ten years standing. My purpose in going among them has been to learn about their life in particular and outcast life in general. This can only be done by becoming part and parcel of its manifestations. There are two kinds of tramps in the United States out-of-works, and, quote, hobos, unquote. The out-of-works are not genuine vagabonds. They really want work and have no sympathy with the hobos. The latter are the real tramps. They make a business of begging, a very good business, too, and keep at it as a rule to the end of their days. Whiskey and Wanderlust, or the love of wandering, are probably the main causes of their existence. But many of them are discouraged criminals, men who have tried their hand at crime and find that they lack criminal wit. They become tramps because they find that life, quote, on the road, end quote, comes the nearest to the life they hoped to lead. They have enough talent to do very well as beggars, better, generally speaking, than the men who have reached the road simply as drunkards. They know more about the tricks of the trade and are cleverer in thinking out schemes and stories. All genuine tramps in America are, however, pretty much the same as far as manners and philosophy are concerned, and all are equally welcome at the, quote, hangout, end quote. The class of society from which they are drawn is generally the very lowest of all, but there are some hobos who have come from the very highest, and these latter are frequently as vicious and depraved as their less well-born brethren. Concerning sexual inversion among tramps, there is a great deal to be said, and I cannot attempt to tell all I have heard about it, but merely to give a general account of the matter. Every hobo in the United States knows what, quote, unnatural intercourse, end quote, means, talking about it freely, and according to my finding, every tenth man practices it and defends his conduct. Boys are the victims of this passion. The tramps gain possession of these boys in various ways. A common method is to stop for a while in some town and gain acquaintance with the slum children. They tell these children all sorts of stories about life, quote, on the road, end quote. How they can ride on the railways for nothing, shoot Indians, and be professionals, professionals. And they choose some boy who specially pleases them. By smiles and flattering caresses, they let him know that the stories are meant for him alone, and before long, if the boy is a suitable subject, he smiles back just as slyly. In time, he learns to think that he is the favorite of the tramp, who will take him on his travels, and he begins to plan secret meetings with the man. The tramp, of course, continues to excite his imagination with stories and caresses, and some fine night there is one boy less in the town. On the road, the lad is called a, quote, Prussian, and his protector a, quote, jocker, end quote. 
The majority of Prussians are between 10 and 15 years of age, but I have known some under 10 and a few over 15. Each is compelled by hobo law to let his jocker do with him as he will, and many, I fear, learn to enjoy his treatment of them. They are also expected to beg in every town they come to, any laziness on their part receiving very severe punishment. How the act of unnatural intercourse takes place is not entirely clear. The hobos are not agreed. From what I have personally observed, I should say that it is usually what they call legwork, intercrural, but sometimes emissio penis in anum, the boy in either case lying on his stomach. I have heard terrible stories of the physical results to the boy of anal intercourse. One evening, near Cumberland, Pennsylvania, I was an unwilling witness to one of the worst scenes that can be imagined. In company with eight hobos, I was in a freight car attached to a slowly moving train. A colored boy succeeded in scrambling into the car, and when the train was well under way again, he was tripped up and seduced, to use the hobo euphemism, by each of the tramps. He made almost no resistance and joked and laughed about the business as if he had expected it. This, indeed, I find to be the general feeling among the boys when they have been thoroughly initiated. At first they do not submit and are inclined to run away or fight. But the men fondle and pet them, and after a while they do not seem to care. Some of them have told me that they get as much pleasure out of the affair as the jocker does. Even little fellows under ten have told me this, and I have known them to willfully tempt their jockers to intercourse. What the pleasure consists in, I cannot say. The youngsters themselves describe it as a delightful tickling sensation in the parts involved, and this is possibly all that it amounts to among the smallest lads. Those who have passed the age of puberty seem to be satisfied in pretty much the same way that the men are. Among the men, the practice is decidedly one of passion. The majority of them prefer a Prussian to a woman, and nothing is more severely judged than rape. One often reads in the newspapers that a woman has been assaulted by a tramp, but the perverted tramp is never the guilty party. I believe, however, that there are a few hobos who have taken to boys because women are so scarce, quote, on the road, end quote. For every woman in hoboland there are a hundred men. That this disproportion has something to do with the popularity of boys is made clear by the following case. In a jail, where I was confined for a month during my life in vagabondage, I got acquainted with a tramp who had the reputation of being a, quote, sod, end quote, sodomist. One day a woman came to the jail to see her husband, who was awaiting trial. One of the prisoners said he had known her before she was married and had lived with her. The tramp was soon to be discharged, and he inquired where the woman lived. On learning that she was still approachable, he looked her up immediately after his release, and succeeded in staying with her for nearly a month. He told me later that he enjoyed his life with her much more than his intercourse with boys. I asked him why he went with boys at all, and he replied, "'Cause there ain't women enough. If I can't get them, I got to have the other.'" It is in jails that one sees the worst side of this perversion. In the daytime, the prisoners are let out into a long hall and could do much as they please. At night they are shut up, two and even four in a cell. If there are any boys in the crowd, they are made use of by all who care to have them. If they refuse to submit, they are gagged and held down. The sheriff seldom knows what goes on, and for the boys to say anything to him would be suicidal. There is a criminal ignorance all over the states concerning the life of these jails, and things go on that would be impossible in any well-regulated prison. In one of these places, I once witnessed the fiercest fight I have ever seen among hobos. A boy was the cause of it. Two men said they loved him, and he seemed to return the affection of both with equal desire. A fight with razors was suggested to settle who should have him. The men prepared for action while the crowd gathered round to watch. They slashed away for over half an hour, cutting each other terribly, and then their backers stopped them for fear of fatal results. The boy was given to the one who was hurt the least. Jealousy is one of the first things one notices in connection with this passion. I have known them to withdraw entirely from the, quote, hangout, end quote, life, simply to be sure that their Prussians were not touched by other tramps. 
Such attachments frequently last for years, and some boys remain with their first jockers until they are, quote, emancipated, end quote. Emancipation means freedom to snare some other boy and make him submit as the other had been obliged to submit when younger. As a rule, the Prussian is freed when he is able to protect himself. If he can defend his honor from all who come, he is accepted into the class of, quote, old stagers, end quote, and may do as he likes. This is the one reward held out to Prussians during their apprenticeship. They are told that some day they can have a boy and use him as they have been used. Thus, Hoboland is always sure of recruits. It is difficult to say how many tramps are sexually inverted. It is not even certainly known how many vagabonds there are in the country. I have stated in one of my papers on tramps that, counting the boys, there are between fifty and sixty thousand genuine hobos in the United States. A vagabond in Texas who saw this statement wrote me that he considered my estimate too low. The newspapers have criticized it as too high, but they are unable to judge. If my figures are, as I believe, at least approximately correct, the sexually perverted tramps may be estimated at between five and six thousand. This includes men and boys. I have been told lately by tramps that the boys are less numerous than they were a few years ago. They say that it is now a risky business to be seen with a boy, and that it is more profitable, as far as begging is concerned, to go without them. Whether this means that the passion is less fierce than it used to be, or that the men find sexual satisfaction among themselves, I cannot say definitely. But from what I know of their disinclination to adopt the latter alternative, I am inclined to think that the passion may be dying out somewhat. I am sure that women are not more numerous, quote, on the road, end quote, than formerly, and that the change, if real, has not been caused by them. So much for my finding in the United States. In England, where I have also lived with tramps for some time, I have found very little contrary sexual feeling. In Germany, also, excepting in prisons and workhouses, it seems very little known among vagabonds. There are a few Jewish wanderers, sometimes peddlers, who are said to have boys in their company, and I am told that they use them as the hobos in the United States use their boys, but I cannot prove this from personal observation. In England I have met a number of male tramps who had no hesitation in declaring their preference for their own sex, and particularly for boys, but I am bound to say that I have seldom seen them with boys. As a rule, they were quite alone, and they seemed to live chiefly by themselves. It is a noteworthy fact that both in England and Germany there are a great many women, quote, on the road, end quote, or, at all events, so near it that intercourse with them is easy and cheap. In Germany, almost every town has its quarter of Stottschietze, women who sell their bodies for a very small sum. They seldom ask over thirty or forty pfennigs for a night, which is usually spent in the open air. In England it is practically the same thing. In all the large cities there are women who are glad to do business for three or four pence, and those, quote, on the road, end quote, for even less. The general impression made on me by the sexually perverted men I have met in vagabondage is that they are abnormally masculine. In their intercourse with boys, they always take the active part. The boys have, in some cases, seemed to me uncommonly feminine, but not as a rule. In the main, they are very much like other lads, and I am unable to say whether their liking for the inverted relationship is inborn or acquired. That it is, however, a genuine liking in altogether too many instances, I do not in the least doubt. As such, and all the more because it is such, it deserves to be more thoroughly investigated and more reasonably treated. Josiah Flint, who wrote the foregoing account of tramp life for the second edition of this volume, was well known as author, sociologist, and tramp. He was especially, and it would seem by innate temperament, the tramp, which part he looked to perfection. He himself referred to his, quote, weasoned face and diminutive form, end quote, and felt completely at home in. He was thus able to throw much light on the psychology of the tramp, and his books, such as Trampling with Tramps, are valuable from this point of view. His real name was F. Willard, and he was a nephew of Miss Frances Willard. He died in Chicago in 1907 
at the age of 38, shortly after writing a frank and remarkable autobiography. I am able to supplement his observations on tramps, so far as England is concerned, by the following passages from a detailed record sent to me by an English correspondent. I am a male invert with complete feminine sexual inclinations. Different meetings with tramps led me to seek intimacy with them, and for about twenty years I have gone on the tramp myself, so that I might come in the closest contact with them in England, Scotland, and Wales. As in the United States, there are two classes of tramps, those who would work, such as harvesters, road makers, etc., and those who will not work, but make tramping a profession. Among both these classes, my experience is that 90%, or I even would be bold enough to say 100%, indulge in homosexuality when the opportunity occurs, and I do not make any distinction between the two classes. There are numerous reasons for this, and I will state a few. A certain number may prefer normal connection with a female, but except for those who tramp in vans and a limited number who have donnas with them, women are not available, as prostitutes very seldom allow intimacy for, quote, love, end quote, except when drunk. Tramps are also afraid of any venereal disease, as it means the misery of the lock hospital. Most of them are sociable and prefer to tramp with a, quote, make, end quote. With this mate, with whom he sleeps and rests and boozes when they are in funds, sexual intimacy naturally takes place, as my experience has been that one of the two is male and the other female in their sexual desires, but I have known instances where they have acted both roles. Then male prostitution is to be had for nothing, and even occasionally when a tramp meets a, quote, toff, end quote, it is a means of earning money, either fairly or otherwise. I have never known a male tramp to refuse satisfaction if I offered a drink or two, or a small sum of money. One told me that he envied, quote, no lords or toffs, end quote, as long as he got plenty of, quote, booze and buggery, end quote. Another one, who told me that he had been twenty-five years on the road, said that he could not endure to sleep alone. He was a peddler, openly of cheap religious books and secretly of the vilest pamphlets and photographs. He had done time, and he said the greatest punishment to him was not being able to have a make who would submit to penetration, though he was not particular what form the sexual act took. Another fine young man, whom I chanced to meet the very day he had been released from a long sentence in prison for burglary, and with whom I passed a night of incessant and almost brutal intimacy, said his punishment was seeing men always about him and being unable to have connection with them. Another and very powerful influence in tramps toward homosexuality is that, in the low lodging houses they are obliged to frequent, a single bed is perhaps double to one with a bedmate whom perhaps he has never seen before, and especially in hot weather, when the rule is nakedness. My sexual desires being for the male invert, I have come most in contact with them and have found that they form much the larger class. Among harvesters and seafaring tramps, it is seldom you find a, quote, dandy, end quote, such as I was considered, and as such I was eagerly courted, and any suggestion of intimacy on my part quickly responded to. As regards the use of young boys for homosexual indulgence, it is not common as it is too dangerous, though I have known boys, especially those belonging to vans or gypsies, to prostitute themselves, always for money. On one occasion, I saw a boy who created quite an outburst of lust of homosexual nature. The incident took place in a small seafaring town in Scotland one evening before a fair was to be held. It occurred in a low public house where a number of very rough and mostly drunken men were assembled. A blind man came in, led by an extremely pretty but effeminate-looking youth of about seventeen, wearing a ragged kilt and with bare legs and feet. He had long, curling, fair hair which reached to his shoulders, and on it an old bonnet was perched. He also wore an old velveteen shooting jacket. 
all eyes were turned on the pair, and they were quickly offered drinks. A remark was made by one man that he believed the youth was a lassie. The boy said, I will show you I am a laddie, and pulled up his kilt, exposing his genitals, and then his posterior. Boisterous laughter greeted this indecent exposure and suggestion, and more drinks were provided. The blind man then played his fiddle, and the boy danced with frequent recurrences of the same indecencies. He was seized, kissed, and caressed by quite a number of men, some of whom endeavored to masturbate him, which he resisted, but performed it for them. After the closing time came, I and about ten or twelve men all occupied the same room. The old man continued to play, and the youth, stark naked, continued to dance and suggested we others should do so, and an erotic scene took place which was only closed to view by the boss, who was present putting out the lamp. Two classes of tramps I have met openly declare their preference for homosexuality. They are men who have been in the army, and sailors and seafaring men in general. It is said that, quote, Jack has a wife in every port, end quote, but I believe from my experience that the wife, in many cases, is of the male sex, and this among those of all nationalities, as is the case with soldiers. Among these, also jealousy is more common than among ordinary tramps, and if you are dandy to a soldier, if you make advances or receive them from a senior, trouble is likely to occur between them. I could give many instances of my own personal experiences to show that tramps are looked upon by men in the country districts as legitimate, complacent, and purchasable objects for homosexual lust. End of Appendix A Recording by Tom Geller, Oberlin, Ohio, TomGeller.com, T-O-M-G-E-L-L-E-R.com Appendix B of Studies in the Psychology of Sex. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2, by Havelock Ellis. Appendix B. The School Friendship of Girls. A school friendship is termed by Italian girls a flame, flama. This term, as explained by Obici and Marchesini, indicates, in school slang, both the beloved person and the friendship in the abstract. But it is a friendship which has the note of passion as felt and understood in this environment. In every college, the flame is regarded as a necessary institution. The friendship is usually of a markedly platonic character, and generally exists between a border on one side and a day pupil on the other. Notwithstanding, however, its apparently non-sexual nature, all the sexual manifestations of college youth circle around it, and, in its varying aspects of differing intensity, all the gradations of sexual sentiment may be expressed. Obici and Marchesini carried on their investigation chiefly among the pupils of normal schools, the age of the girls being between twelve and nineteen or twenty. There are both boarders and day pupils at these colleges. The boarders are most inflammable, but it is the day pupils who furnish the sparks. Obici and Marchesini received much assistance in their studies from former pupils, who are now themselves teachers. One of these, a day pupil who had never herself been either the object or the agent in one of those passions, but had had ample opportunity of making personal observations, writes as follows, quote, The flame proceeds exactly like a love relationship. It often happens that one of the girls shows man-like characteristics, either in physical type or in energy and decision of character. The other lets herself be loved, acting with all the obstinacy, and one might almost say the shyness, of a girl with her lover. The beginning of these relationships is quite different from the usual beginnings of friendship. It is not by being always together, talking and studying together, that two become flames. No, generally they do not even know each other. One sees the other on the stairs, in the garden, in the corridors, and the emotion that arises is nearly always called forth by beauty and physical grace. 
then the one who is first struck begins a regular courtship frequent walks in the garden when the other is likely to be at the window of her classroom pauses on the stairs to see her pass in short a mute adoration made up of glances and sighs later come presents of beautiful flowers and little messages conveyed by complacent companions finally if the flame shows signs of appreciating all these proofs of affection comes the letter of declaration letters of declaration are long and ardent to such a degree that they equal or surpass real love declarations the courted one nearly always accepts sometimes with enthusiasm oftenest with many objections and doubts as to the affection declared it is only after many entreaties that she yields and the relationship begins unquote. another collaborator who has herself always aroused very numerous flames gives a very similar description together with other particulars thus she states quote, it may be said that sixty per cent of the girls in a college have flame relationships and that of the remaining forty only half refuse from deliberate repulsion to such affections the other twenty are excluded either because they are not sufficiently pleasing in appearance or because their characters do not inspire sympathy unquote. and regarding the method of beginning the relationship she writes quote, sometimes flames arise before the two future friends have even seen each other merely because one of them is considered as beautiful sympathetic nice or elegant elegance exerts an immense fascination especially on the boarders who are bound down by monotonous and simple habits as soon as a boarder hears of a day pupil that she is charming and elegant she begins to feel a lively sympathy toward her rapidly reaching anxiety to see her the longed-for morning at length arrives the beloved unconscious of the tumult of passions she has aroused goes into school not knowing that her walk her movements her garments are being observed from stairs or dormitory corridor for the boarders these events constitute an important part of college life and often assume for some the aspect of a tragedy which fortunately may be gradually resolved into a comedy or a farce Unquote. Many letters are written in the course of these relationships. Obici and Marchesini have been able to read over three hundred such letters, which had been carefully preserved by the receivers, and which, indeed, formed the chief material for their study. These letters clearly show that the flame most usually arises from a physical sympathy, an admiration of beauty and elegance. The letters written in this flame relationship are full of passion. They appear to be often written during periods of physical excitement and psychic erotism, and may be considered, Obici and Marchesini remark, a form of intellectual onanism, of which the writers afterward feel remorse and shame as of a physically dishonorable act. In reference to the underlying connection of these feelings with the sexual impulse, one of the lady collaborators writes, quote, I can say that a girl who is in love with a man never experiences flame emotions for a companion. Unquote. Obici and Marchesini thus summarize the differential character of flames as distinguished from ordinary friendships. Quote, one, the extraordinary frequency with which, even by means of subterfuges, the lovers exchange letters. Two, the anxiety to see and talk to each other, to press each other's hands, to embrace and kiss. Three, the long conversations and the very long reveries. Four, persistent jealousy with its manifold arts and usual results. Five, exaltation of the beloved's qualities. Six, the habit of writing the beloved's name everywhere. Seven, absence of envy for the loved one's qualities. Eight, the lover's abnegation in conquering all obstacles to the manifestations of her love. Nine, the vanity with which some respond to flame declarations. 10. The consciousness of doing a prohibited thing. 11. The pleasure of conquest, of which the trophies, letters, and so on, are preserved. Unquote. The difference between a flame and a friendship is very well marked in the absolute exclusiveness of the former, whence arises the possibility of jealousy. 
At the same time friendship and love are here woven together. The letters are chaste, a few exceptions among so many letters not affecting this general rule, and the purity of the flame relationship is also shown by the fact that it is usually between boarders and day pupils, girls in different classes in different rooms, and seldom between those who are living in close proximity to each other. Quote, certainly, writes one of the lady collaborators, the first sensual manifestations develop in girls with physical excitement, pure and simple, but at all events I would wish to believe it, the majority of college girls find sufficient satisfaction in being as near as possible to the beloved person of whichever sex, in mutual admiration and in kissing, or very frequently in conversation that is by no means moral, though usually very metaphorical. The object of such conversation is to discover the most important mysteries of human nature, the why and the wherefore. It deals with natural necessities, which the girl feels and has an intuition of, but as yet knows nothing definite about. Such conversations are the order of the day in schools and in colleges and specially revolve around procreation, the most difficult mystery of all. They are a heap of stupidities." Unquote. This lady had only known of one definite homosexual relationship during the whole of her college life. The couple in question were little liked and had no other flames. The chief general sexual manifestations, this lady concludes, which she had noted among her companions, was a constant preoccupation with sexual mysteries and the necessity of talking about them perpetually. Another lady collaborator who had lived in a normal school had had somewhat wider experiences. She entered at the age of fourteen and experienced the usual loneliness and unhappiness of a new pupil. One day, as she was standing pensive and alone in a corner of the room, a companion, one who on her arrival had been charged to show her over the college, ran up to her, quote, embracing me, closing my mouth with a kiss, and softly caressing my hair. I gazed at her in astonishment, but experienced a delicious sensation of supreme comfort. Here began the idyll. I was subjected to a furious tempest of kisses and caresses, which quite stunned me and made me ask myself the reason of such a new and unforeseen affection. I ingeniously inquired the reason, and the reply was, I love you, you struck me immediately I saw you, because you are so beautiful and so white, and because it makes me happy and soothes me when I can pass my hands through your hair and kiss your plump white face. I need a soul and a body. This seemed to me the language of a superior person, for I could not grasp all its importance. As on the occasion when she first embraced me, I looked at her in astonishment and could not for the moment respond to a new fury of caresses and kisses. I felt that they were not like the kisses of my mamma, my papa, my brother, and other companions. They gave me unknown sensations. The contact of those moist and freshy lips disturbed me. Then came the exchange of letters and the usual rites and duties of flames. When we met in the presence of others, we were only to greet each other simply, for flames were strictly prohibited. I obeyed because I liked her, but also because I was afraid of their fellow-like jealousy. She would suffocate me, even bite me when I played joyously and thoughtlessly with others, and woe to me if I failed to call her when I was combing my hair. She liked to see me with my hair down, and would rest her head on my shoulder, especially if I were partially undressed. I let her do as she liked, and she would scold me severely because I was never first in longing for her, running to meet her and kissing her. But at the same time the thought of losing her, the thought that perhaps one day she would shower her caresses on others, secretly wounded my heart. But I never told her this. One day, however, when, with a headmistress gazing at a beautiful landscape, I was suddenly overwhelmed with sadness and burst out crying. The headmistress inquired what was the matter, and throwing myself in her arms, I sobbed. I love her, and I shall die if she leaves off loving me. She smiled, and the smile went through my heart. I saw at once how silly I was, and what a wrong road my companion was on. From that day I could no longer endure my flame. The separation was absolute. I courageously bore bites and insults, even scratches on my face followed by long complaints and complete prostration. I thought it would be mean to accuse her, 
but I invented a pretext for having the number of my bed changed. This was because she would dress quietly and come to pass hours by my bed, resting her head on the pillow. She said she wished to smell the perfume of my health and freshness. This continual turbulent desire had now nauseated me, and I wished to avoid it altogether. Later I heard that she had formed a relationship which was not blessed by any sacred rite. Unquote. Notwithstanding the platonic character of the correspondences, Obici and Marchesini remark, there is really a substratum of emotional sexuality beneath it, and it is this which finds its expression in the indecorous conversations already referred to. The flame is a love fiction, a play of sexual love. This characteristic comes out in the frequently romantic names of men and women invented to sign the letters. Even in the letters themselves, however, the element of sexual impressionability may be traced. Quote, on Friday we went to a service at San B, writes one who was in an institution directed by nuns. But, unfortunately, I saw M. L. at a window when I thought she was at A, and I was in a nervous state the whole time. Imagine that that dear woman was at the window with bare arms and, as it seemed to me, in her chemis. Unquote. No doubt a similar impression might have been made on a girl living in her own family, but it is certain that the imaginative colouring tends to be more lively in those living in colleges, and shut off from that varied and innocent observation which renders those outside colleges freer and more unprejudiced. On a boy who is free to see as many women as he chooses, a woman's face cannot make such an impression as on a boy who lives in a college and who is liable to be, as it were, electrified if he sees any object belonging to a woman, especially if he sees it by stealth or during a mood of erotism. Such an object calls out a whole series of wanton imaginations, which it could not do in one who, by his environment, was already armed against any tendencies to erotic fetishism. The attraction exerted by that which we see but seldom, and around which fancy assiduously plays, the attraction of forbidden fruit, produces tendencies and habits which could scarcely develop in freedom. Curiosity is acute, and is augmented by the obstacles which stand in the way of its satisfaction. Flame attraction is the beginning of such a morbid fetishism, a sentiment which under other conditions would never have gone beyond ordinary friendship, may thus become a flame, and even a flame of markedly sexual character. Under these influences, boys and girls feel the purest and simplest sentiments in a hyperesthetic manner. The girls here studied have lost an exact conception of the simple manifestations of friendship, and think they are giving evidence of exquisite sensibility and true friendship by loving a companion to madness. Friendship in them has become a passion." That this intense desire to love a companion passionately is a result of the college environments may be seen by the following extract from a letter. Quote, you know, dear, much better than I do, how acutely girls living away from their own homes and far from all those who are dearest to them on earth feel the need of loving and being loved. You can understand how hard it is to be obliged to live without anyone to surround you with affection. Unquote and the writer goes on to say how all her love turns to her correspondent. While there is an unquestionable sexual element in the flame relationship, this cannot be regarded as an absolute expression of real congenital perversion of the sex instinct. The frequency of the phenomena, as well as the fact that, on leaving college to enter social life, the girl usually ceases to feel these emotions, are sufficient to show the absence of congenital abnormality. The estimate of the frequency of flames in normal schools, given to Obici and Marchesini by several lady collaborators, was about 60%, but there is no reason to suppose that women teachers furnish a larger contingent of perverted individuals than other women. The root is organic, but the manifestations are ideal and platonic, in contrast with some other manifestations found in college life. No inquiry was made as to the details of solitary sexual manifestations in the colleges, the fact that they exist to more or less extent being sufficiently recognized. The conversations already referred to are a measure of the excitations of sexuality existing in these college inmates and multiplied in energy by communication. 
such discourse was wrote one collaborator the order of the day and it took place chiefly at the time when letter-writing also was easiest it may well be that sensual excitations transformed into ethereal sentiments served to increase the intensity of the flames taken altogether a bridge and marquezini conclude the flame may be regarded as a provisional synthesis we find here in solution together the physiological element of incipient sexuality the physical element of the tenderness natural to this age and sex the element of occasion offered by the environment and the social element with its nascent altruism that the phenomena described in minute detail by obici and marcassini closely resemble the phenomena as they exist in english girls schools is indicated by the following communication, for which I am indebted to a lady who is familiar with an English girls' college of very modern type. Quote, From inquiries made in various quarters, and through personal observation and experience, I have come to the conclusion that the romantic and emotional attachments formed by girls for their female friends and companions, attachments which take a great hold of their minds for the time being, are far commoner than is generally supposed among English girls, more especially at school or college, or wherever a number of girls or young women live together in one institution and are much secluded. As far as I have been able to find out, these attachments, which have their own local names, for example, raves, spoons, and so on, are comparatively rare in the smaller private schools, and totally absent among girls of the poorer class attending board and national schools, perhaps because they mix more freely with the opposite sex. I can say from personal experience that in one of the largest and best English colleges, where I spent some years, raving is especially common in spite of arrangements which one would have thought would have abolished most unhealthy feelings. The arrangements there are very similar to a large boys' college. There are numerous boarding houses which have, on an average, forty to fifty students. Each house is under the management of a well-educated housemistress, assisted by house governesses quite separate from college teachers. Each house has a large garden with tennis courts and so on, and cricket, hockey, and other games are carried on to a large extent, games being not only much encouraged, but much enjoyed. Each girl has a separate cubicle or bedroom, and no junior, under seventeen years of age, is allowed to enter the cubicle or bedroom of another without asking permission, or to go to the bedrooms during the day. In fact, everything is done to discourage any morbid feelings. But all the same, as far as my experience goes, the friendships there seem more violent and more emotional than in most places, and sex subjects form one of the chief topics of conversation. In such large schools and colleges, these raves are not only numerous, but seem to be perennial among the girls of all ages, from thirteen years upward girls under that age may be fond of some other student or teacher, but in quite a different way. These raves are not mere friendships in the ordinary sense of the word, nor are they incompatible with ordinary friendships. A girl with a rave often has several intimate friends, for whom affection is felt without the emotional feelings and pleasurable excitement which characterize a rave. From what I have been told by those who have experienced these raves, and have since been in love with men, the emotions called forth in both cases were similar, although in the case of the rave this fact was not recognized at the time. This appears to point to a sexual basis, but, on the other hand, there are many cases where the feeling seems to be more spiritual, a sort of uplifting of the whole soul, with an intense desire to lead a very good life the feeling being one of reverence more than anything else for the loved one, with no desire to become too intimate and no desire for physical contact. Raves, as a rule, begin quite suddenly. They may be mutual or all on one side. In the case of schoolgirls, the mutual rave is generally found between two companions, or the girls may have a rave for one of their teachers or some grown-up acquaintance who does not necessarily enter into the school life. In this case, there may or may not be a feeling of affection for the girl by her rave, though minus all the emotional feelings. Occasionally, a senior student will have a rave on a little girl, but these cases are rare and not very active in their symptoms, girls over eighteen having fewer raves and generally condemning them. In the large school already referred to, of which I have personal knowledge, raving was very general, hardly anyone being free from it, 
any fresh student would soon fall a victim to the fashion, which rather points to the fact that it is infectious. Sometimes there might be a lull in the general raving, only to reappear after an interval in more or less of an epidemic form. Sometimes nearly all the raves were felt by students for their teachers. At other times it was more apparent between the girls themselves. Sometimes one teacher was raved on by several girls. In many cases the girls raving on a teacher would have a very great friendship with one of their companions, talking with each other constantly of their respective raves, describing their feelings and generally letting off steam to one another, indulging sometimes in the active demonstrations of affection which they were debarred from showing the teacher herself, and in some cases having no desire to do so even if they could. As far as I have been able to judge, there is not necessarily any attraction for physical characteristics as beauty, elegance, and so on. The two participants are probably both of strong character, or a weak character raves on a stronger, but rarely vice versa. I have often noticed that the same person may be raved on at different times by several people of different characters and of all ages, say up to thirty years of age. It is hard to say why some persons more than others should inspire this feeling. Often they are reserved without any particular physical attraction, and often despising raving and emotional friendships, and give no encouragement to them. That the majority of raves have a sexual basis may be true, but I am sure that in the majority of cases, where young girls are concerned, this is not in the least recognized, and no impurity is indulged in or wished for. The majority of the girls are entirely ignorant of all sexual matters, and understand nothing whatever about them. But they do wander about them, and talk about them constantly, more especially when they have a rave, which seems to point to some subtle connection between the two. That this ignorance exists is largely to be deplored. The subject, if once thought of, is always thought of, and talked of, and information is, at length, generally gained in a regrettable manner. From personal experience I know the evil results that this ignorance and constant endeavouring to find out everything has on the mind and bodies of schoolgirls. If children had the natural and simple laws of creation carefully explained to them by their parents, much harm would be prevented, and the conversation would not always turn on sexual matters. The Bible is often consulted for the discovery of hidden mysteries. Raves and teachers are far commoner than between two girls. In this case the girl makes no secret of her attachment, constantly talking of it and describing her feelings to any who care to listen, and writing long letters to her friends about the same. In the case of two girls there is more likely to be a sexual element, great pleasure being taken in close contact with one another, and frequent kissing and hugging. When parted, long letters are written, often daily. They are full of affectionate expressions of love and so on, but there is also a frequent reference to the happiness and desire to do well that their love has inspired them with, while often very deeply religious feelings appear to be generated and many good resolutions are made. Their various emotional feelings are described in every minute detail to each other. The duration of raves varies. I have known them to last three or four years, more often only a few months, Occasionally, what began as a rave will turn into a sensible, firm friendship. I imagine that there is seldom any actual inversion, and on growing up the raves generally cease. That the ravers feel and act like a pair of lovers, there is no doubt, and the majority put down these romantic friendships for their own sex as due, in a great extent, in the case of girls at schools, to being without the society of the opposite sex. This may be true in some cases, but personally I think the question open to discussion. These friendships are often found among girls who have left school and have every liberty, even among girls who have had numerous flirtations with the opposite sex, who cannot be accused of inversion, and who have all the feminine and domestic characteristics. In illustration of these points, I may bring forward the following case. A and B were two girls at the same college. They belonged to different cliques or sets, occupied different bedrooms, never met in their school work, and were practically only known to one another by name. One day they chanced to sit next to one another at some meal. They both already had raves, A on an actor she had lately seen, B on a married woman at her home. 
the conversation happened to turn on raves, and mutual attraction was suddenly felt. From that moment a new interest came into their lives. They lived for one another. At the time A was fourteen, B a year older. Both were somewhat precocious for their age, were practical, with plenty of common sense, very keen on games, interested in their lessons, and very independent, but at the same time with marked feminine characteristics and popular with the opposite sex. After the first feeling of interest there was a subtle excitement and desire to meet again. All their thoughts were occupied with the subject. Each day they managed as many private meetings as possible. They met in the passages in order to say good night with many embraces. As far as possible they hid their feelings from the rest of the world. They became inseparable, and a very lasting and real but somewhat emotional affection, in which the sexual element was certainly marked, sprang up between them. Although at the time they were both quite ignorant of sexual matters, yet they indulged their sexual instincts to some extent. They felt surcharged with hitherto unexperienced feelings and emotions, instinct urged them to let these have play, but instinctively they also had a feeling that to do so would be wrong. This feeling they endeavoured to argue out and find reasons for. When parted for any length of time, they felt very miserable and wrote pages to one another every day, pouring forth in writing their feelings for one another. In this time of active attraction they both became deeply religious for a time. The active part of the affection continued for three or four years, and now, after an interval of ten years, they are both exceedingly fond of one another, although their paths in life are divided and each has since experienced love for a man. Both look back upon the sexual element in their friendship with some interest. It may be remarked in passing that A and B are both attractive girls to men and women, and B especially appears always to have roused rave feelings in her own sex, without the slightest encouragement on her part. The duration of this rave was exceptionally long, the majority only lasting a few months, while some girls have one rave after another, or two or three together. I may mention one other case, where I believe that if it had a sexual basis, this was not recognized by the parties concerned or their friends. Two girls, over twenty years of age, passed in a corridor. A few words were exchanged, the beginning of a very warm and fast friendship. They said it was not a rave. They were absolutely devoted to one another, but from what I know of them and what they have since told me, their feelings were quite free from any sexual desires, though their love for one another was great. When parted they exchanged letters daily, but were always endeavouring to urge one another on in all the virtues, and as far as I can gather they never gave way to any feeling they thought was not for the good of their souls. Letters and presents are exchanged, vows of eternal love are made, quarrels are engaged in for the mere pleasure of reconciliation, and jealousy is easily manifested. Although raves are chiefly found among schoolgirls, they are by no means confined to them, but are common among any community of women of any age, say under thirty, and are not unknown among married women when there is no inversion. In these cases there is usually, of course, no ignorance of sexual matters. Whether there is any direct harm in these friendships, I have not been able to make up my mind. In the case of schoolgirls, if there is not too much emotion generated, and if the sexual feelings are not indulged in, I think they may do more good than harm. Later on in life, when all one's desires and feelings are at their strongest, it is more doubtful. Unquote. That the phenomena as found at the girls' colleges of America are exactly similar to those in Italy and England is shown, among other evidence, by some communications sent to Mr. E. G. Lancaster of Clark University, Worcester, Massachusetts, a few years ago. Mr. E. G. Lancaster sent out a questionnaire to over 800 teachers and older pupils dealing with various points connected with adolescence, and received answers from 91 persons containing information which bore on the present question. Of this number, 28 male and 41 female had been in love before the age of 25, while eleven of each sex had had no love experiences, this indicating, since the women were in a majority, that the absence of love experience is more common in men than in women. 
These answers were from young people between sixteen and twenty-five years of age. Two males and seven females have loved imaginary characters, while three males and not less than forty-six females speak of passionate love for the same sex. Love of the same sex, Lancaster remarks, though not generally known, is very common. It is not mere friendship. The love is strong, real, and passionate. It may be remarked that these forty-nine cases were reported without solicitation, since there was no reference to homosexual love in the questionnaire. Many of the answers to the syllabus are so beautiful, Lancaster observes, that if they could be printed in full, no comment would be necessary. He quotes a few of the answers. Thus a woman of thirty-three writes, quote, At fourteen I had my first case of love, but it was with a girl. It was insane, intense love, but had the same quality and sensations as my first love with a man at eighteen. In neither case was the object idealized. I was perfectly aware of the faults. Nevertheless, my whole being was lost, immersed in their existence. The first lasted two years, the second seven years. No love has since been so intense, but now these persons, though living, are no more to me than the very stranger. Unquote. Another woman of thirty-five writes, quote, Girls between the ages of fourteen and eighteen at college, or girls' schools, often fall in love with the same sex. This is not friendship. The loved one is older, more advanced, more charming or beautiful. When I was a freshman in college, I knew at least thirty girls who were in love with a senior. Some sought her because it was the fashion. But I knew that my own homage, and that of many others, was sincere and passionate. I loved her because she was brilliant and utterly indifferent to the love shown her. She was not pretty, though at the time we thought her beautiful. One of her adorers, on being slighted, was ill for two weeks. On her return she was speaking to me when the object of our admiration came into the room. The shock was too great and she fainted. When I reached the senior year, I was the recipient of languishing glances, original verses, roses, and passionate letters written at midnight and three in the morning. Unquote. No similar confessions are recorded from men. In South America, corresponding phenomena have been found in schools and colleges of the same class. There they have been especially studied by Mercante, in the convent high schools of Buenos Aires, where the students are girls between the ages of ten and twenty-two. Mercante found that homosexuality here is not clearly defined or explicit, and usually it is combined with a predisposition to romanticism and mysticism. It is usually of a passive kind, but in this form so widespread as to constitute a kind of epidemic. It was most manifest in institutions where the greatest stress was placed on religious instruction. The recreations of the school in question were quiet and enervating. Active or boisterous sports were prohibited to the end that good manners might be cultivated. In the playrooms the girls observed the strictest etiquette, and discipline was maintained independent of oversight by teachers. Mercante could hardly believe, however, that the decorum was more than external. Later, when the girls broke up, they were found in pairs or small groups, in corners, on benches, beside the pillars, arm in arm or holding hands. What they were speaking of could be surmised. Quote, Their conversation and confidences came to me indirectly. They were sweethearts talking about their affairs. In spite of the spiritual and feminine character of these unions, one element was active, the other passive. Thus confirming the authorities on this matter, Garnier, Regi, Lombroso, Bonfili, unquote. Mercante found the points of view of the two members of each pair to be quite different in moral aspect. Quote, one takes the initiative, she commands, she cares for, she offers, she gives, she makes decisions, she considers the present, she imagines the future, she smooths over difficulties, gives encouragement and inspiration to her companion. The other obeys, accepts, is docile, gives way in matters of dispute, and expresses her affection with sweet words and promises of love and submission. The atmosphere, silent and quiet, was, however, charged with jealousy, squabble, desires, illusions, dreams, and lamentations. Unquote. 
Mercante's informant assured him that practically every girl had her affinity, and that there were at least twenty well-defined love affairs. The active party starts the conquest by making eyes, next she becomes more intimate, and finally proposes. Women being highly adaptable, the nail fit, unless she is rebellious, gets into the spirit of it all. If she is not complacent, she must prepare for conflict, because the prey becomes more desirable the more the resistance encountered. Opportunity was offered to Mercante to observe some of the correspondence between the girls. Though of indifferent training and ability in other respects, the girls speak and write regarding their affairs with most admirable diction and style. No data are given regarding the actual intimate relations between the girls. End of Appendix B End of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2 by Havelock Ellis